Just a couple of things. My name is Alfonso Martinez Arias, and um, really, uh, because of what I've seen, this is an emerging area where there is a lot of questions, this, this issue of preprints. And um, a few months ago, in the United States, I think Howard Hughes took it very seriously, and there was a meeting in, uh, in Washington to which some of you were, were present, in which the, the, the value and, and the, the nature of preprints were, were, were discussed. I've noticed in, I've been very interested in preprints since they came about, because as I hope it, it will emerge today, uh, publishing in the biomedical sciences is becoming a very frustrating exercise for those who try to publish. And uh, preprints are not publications as we know, but they offer a way of exposing to the, to the public and to the, uh, uh, our colleagues the work that we do in, in a manner that, that it's open to discussion and open to criticism. Then you can, you can send the papers to peer review, but, but then the visibility of your work is not delayed. So I realized that when you talk to people about preprints, they, they fall into different camps. They, most people don't know what preprints are. Uh, there is also people that worry whether preprints are a valid way of disseminating your, uh, your work. Um, there is people that they just outright uh, decide that they are not uh, a useful way of evaluating people's work. A lot of these issues were discussed in this meeting in, in the US, and I thought that it would be good to have in a place like Cambridge a discussion that tries to tell people what uh, preprints are, whether they are valuable or not, to hear different voices and have a discussion, and that's what I hope that we will have today. I am very grateful to the speakers that have come to discuss. I think that that's, uh, some of them have told me what they want is a dialogue here. Like everything that is semi-organized, we need a schedule, but that schedule, it, it's open to, to modification. We might go faster or might go, somebody asked me, is there so much to say about preprints? We shall see. We shall see, it, it depends on you. I also want to say that uh, thanks to the Office of Scholarly Communication of the university, particularly Danny Kingsley and her team, this is being streamed. So don't underestimate the, the spaces in the, in the theater because I think they are filled <laughs> by other people. And, and we live in this world where there is a lot more people watching than, than, than there might be here and, and maybe they will participate. And for those that want to participate, it's all over the, the, the Twitter, but that's the hashtag of, of, of the meeting. And it'll be very interesting to hear uh, your views and, and to hear your opinions. I think the, the video of the event will remain in the university site and um, and therefore people will be able to see it. And I know, and I'm very grateful also to Jessica Polka from ASAP Bio, who has also been interested in disseminating and everything. This is, I think, at the very least, it's an interesting issue. Probably it's also an important issue. And I hope that today uh, we can actually discuss and, and we can uh, get some insights into whether this is a future, like those lineages in evolution that is gonna die without going anywhere or whether this is a future that we should respond and, and what shape should it take. So uh, the only thing that I have to remind you, uh, and I'm told by Hannah, that the, uh, I just want to read you the photographs and films that appear here will be used by the University of Cambridge for the purposes of promoting its activities and may be published on the university website and circulated to the press and other media organizations for publications, transmissions, or broadcast. If you do not wish to appear in the photographs or films, please avoid the area of filming and the area of photographs. Okay? <laughs> and it's important that you know that. You're gonna be in the center of it, John. The only other thing that is very, very important here, it's, uh, so we'll see how it goes. I mean, I've just organized the program, we'll see how we go, if we have a break or if we need a break or not. The toilets, unfortunately, this is a very old building, are not outside, it's not that old, <laughs> but they're in the ground floor. <laughs> and if you go to the ground floor and move, I forget this to the right or to the left, to one side is the exit and to the other is the toilet. So you will recognize very quickly what to use. So without further ado, I think uh, first uh, I'd like to have the, the words of the publishers and no better than John Ingalls, the, the publisher of Cold Spring Harbor, who many years ago, uh, another meeting that we had, some of you might remember in the Department of Genetics, uh, uh, shortly afterwards he told me he had this idea where the biologist had head of archive and he had this idea of trying to develop a preprint server for biologists. And, and 
and we've had a conversation, and I think the product is Bioarchive, and I think I will let him tell you what it is, how it's doing, and what is the situation. Yeah. <coughs> Okay, so I need to find my slides, first of all, uh, which must be here. Uh, so while I do that, I'm not quite sure, Mark, how do I uh, make it bigger? <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, first of all, um, my very grateful thanks to Alfonso for the opportunity to be here um, and talk about this interesting topic with this interesting group of people. But, you know, I, I spent eight very happy years working and living in this city uh, way back in the 20th century. Looks like probably before a lot of you were born. Um, and uh, it's always a treat uh, to come back here. Um, I am now based here at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, which I hope is familiar to you for its science, possibly for its books and journals, uh, and possibly also because you may have had the opportunity to come, as 10,000 scientists a year do, to our campus for a meeting or for a course. And um, we, therefore, who work there, are very privileged to have the chance to talk to lots of scientists. And back in 2012, my co-conspirator, Richard Sever, and I um, were picking up lots of evidence of the rising frustration of, with, of scientists with the conventional publication system. And these are the kinds of remarks that we were hearing, um, all kinds of complaints about inefficiency, about speed, about the um, torturous process of peer review and the feeling in particular that people wanted to know the latest stuff and make their own judgment about whether they thought it was any good or not. And the solution to this problem, many people said, was give us something that the physicists have had for, at that point, 20 years. Archive is actually not a very familiar project amongst biomedical scientists, but in, if you talk to any physicist or mathematician, you'll find that, they, that the archive is an absolutely central part of their communication system, and has been since 1991. It's been around long enough for it to be established now, not just a mean, as a means of sharing information, but a means of establishing priority of discovery. It covers, it started with physics, one particular branch of physics and expanded to include math, engineering, computer science, and uh, in, I think, 2003, quantitative biology. They get 100,000 submissions a year, and a great deal of what is published in the physics journals, in particular in the mathematics journals, has appeared first on the archive. The support for this totally free service comes from Cornell University and a, a variety of uh, academic institutions and foundations. So that was the model that Richard and I thought could work in biology, an archive for biology. But um, the question was, how would we make it resemble archive in, its, in many ways, but also adapt it for the purposes of biologists? We had a sense that it needed to be a dedicated, publisher neutral service, not connected with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press in a direct way, but a dedicated service for preprints. It should be free to post and free to read. There would be no associated peer review of any kind. There would be the opportunity to revise the manuscript, and the author could then send that manuscript to any journal that she thought would was appropriate and would take it. And we also thought that the financial model for the service would be similar to that of archive, namely support from institutions and funding organizations. So we had, I mean, we were aware of the fact that this was not the first attempt to establish a service of this kind in biology. There had been at least two previous efforts, maybe more. One particularly high profile had been begun by Nature Publishing Group in 
2012, in 2006. And when we were thinking about this, that effort, Nature of Proceedings, had only lately been shut down. But we had reasons for optimism. Part of that was the way that science has gone in the last few years and the way that scientists have changed in the past few years. A new enthusiasm for openness, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The rising influence of young people who had grown up with the internet. The rising influence of people from the quantitative scientific disciplines, from math, from physics, from engineering even, who were moving into biology and bringing with them an awareness of archive and what it could bring. This frustration with conventional publishing that I alluded to. And we also noticed that more, there were more manuscripts coming into the quantitative biology section of archive. So that all gave us the sense that we really, you know, there was something here perhaps to build on. And of course, we had the culture of the laboratory also at our backs, where a place where since, basically since the 1930s, scientists have come to share their work, to argue about it, and, and uh, basically get the benefit of the community's input into what it is that they're doing. And the president of the lab, I think, put it very nicely in this quotation at the bottom. However, we were aware of the fact that we would have to do some things to, re what, to reduce what we call preprint anxiety and, and try to accelerate acceptance of preprints in, in biomedicine. So there were a few basic and, basic and immediate things that we'd have to do. First of all, the submission system would have to be simple, straightforward, not the kind of complexity that people were familiar with from journals. We'd have to have a site that was operational 24-7, 365, always up. We'd have to make sure that authors knew that they had total control over their work. This was work in process. So they needed to be able to decide whether they prevented any reuse at that with their work at, of their work at that stage, or they could license it with a range of uh, Creative Commons licenses. There needed to be a screening system. It couldn't be just completely open to everyone, but it needed to be fair and it needed to be fast. And we decided, too, that we should restrict bioarchive to manuscripts of research papers. In other words, not data sets, not software, not isolated figures. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but we felt that the most value would come from providing a rapid means of research results which had been written up in ways that people recognize. The posting should be rapid. There needed to be some way of showing how much usage was being made of this content. And it was important to make the distinction that this was not a journal. And we did that in a variety of ways. One decision was to have only full text PDFs um, as uh, to, to provide the, the full text in only PDF, I should say, but the abstract was available in XML. And we t when we talked about this service, and it was a service, not a publication, we talked about posting and distribution rather than publishing. In the longer term, though, there were much bigger issues, and, and some of it surrounded authors' concerns, of which I've listed quite a few here. Um, if I put my preprint up, would my, would my competitor then gain an advantage in, in some way? What happens if a journal says, oh, you put that paper on a preprint server, we're not going to consider it? What would happen if a journal said, we are interested in your paper, but somebody has put a preprint up, and so it's no longer, your results are no longer novel? What would happen if funders and institutions said, we're not interested in preprints as some kind of support for what it is you want us to do, give you a job, give you a grant. And what would happen if preprints, wherever they were, were simply not discoverable? We knew we had to address those things. They would not be immediate. The first thing to do was to get the service up and running. That took, would take education, that would take lobbying, and it would also, we thought, require in the medium term, integration with the conventional journal publishing system. So with a good deal of due diligence and a great deal of support, particularly from the president of the laboratory, 
we were able to launch BioArchive in November 2013. Um, it spanned all, at that time, it spanned just the life sciences, and it was operated as a service by and funded by the laboratory. So when you submit to BioArchive as an author, we ask you to make some choices. You need to tell us whether your paper is new, your, your results are new, confirmatory, or, con or con contradictory. We ask you to put the paper in just one of 26 subject categories, and we ask you to license it in some way. As I say, a wide range of choices. There is a two-stage screening process for every manuscript that comes in. One is an in-house one, which basically is to make sure that the content is within the scope of the service and appropriate. And we also do a plagiarism check at that point. Then the manuscript goes into the hands of a group of scientists and physicians that we call affiliates. These are very important people as far as we are concerned. Their job is to tell us that this is science. And that may seem like a simple question, but in the outer realms of bioinformatics and, math and, and mathematical biology, one needs an expert to tell you about that. So this group of affiliates, some of whom are represented in this room, but I'm not going to unmask you, um, they cover a wide range of expertise and locations. So their job is to tell us that this paper is science, that it is a research paper and perhaps and not you know, a, a blue sky hypothesis unsupported by any kind of data. And in the case of work with human health implications, we have a separate loop involving medically qualified affiliates who basically answer the question for us, if this is wrong, because it hasn't been peer reviewed, if this is wrong, will it have negative effects on the public? And if the answer to that question is yes, then the paper is politely declined. And we have had instances of that happen. Once the manuscript is posted, it gets a date stamp, it gets a citable DOI. There are these usage metrics that I mentioned, both in terms of downloads from the site and alt metrics. And when a paper, when a manuscript is finally published by a journal, then we create a link to the published version. And there are some journals that are interested now in making links back from the published version to BioArchive. When that happens, Google Scholar makes a, a, a terrific job of, of assembling the different versions so that you can find them all in one spot. So what's the benefit? Why, why do this? Well, the obvious one is to speed up the availability of your results to a community of peers who can look at what you've done, uh, come to their own conclusions about it, give you feedback on it uh, if they wish to and you wish to receive it. And another benefit, particularly for early career scientists, given the generally slow nature of conventional publication process, is that by posting a preprint, you can show your granting body or your tenure committee that here is evidence of productivity. So um, not to belabor the point about the slowness of conventional publication, but Steve Royal has put together this very um, valuable uh, uh, collection of, of findings showing the, the length of time through, through which conventional publishing works at different stages in that process. And then somewhat mischievously, we put BioArchive in to show that posting is basically immediate, usually within a day. So how are we doing to answer uh, Alfonso's question? Well, right now, we have 6,300 manuscripts on the site. Of all the manuscripts we've received, meant much more than 90% have been acceptable. They've passed this, that screening step. Interestingly, 97% uh, of the manuscripts we've received have been labeled as new findings. And we thought that the opportunity to post results <coughs> that were contradictory or conf confirmatory, which are hard to publish in journals, we thought people might take that advantage up 
far more than they currently have. Perhaps that will change as we go forward. Of the manuscripts we posted, um, a quarter have been revised at least once. And that is interesting, too, because that's, not, that's, not, um, that's new behavior on the part of scientists. There hasn't generally been that opportunity to do that in the past. So if you look at these manuscripts, it covers an awful lot of people from an awful lot of countries and lots and lots of institutions. So um, we are beginning to feel that you know people are finding this useful. Um, there's a currently rising submission rate of manuscripts, getting up towards 500 a month. And the usage is very large, over a million accesses a month. This is just a chart to show that, that uh, increase in submissions, um, that number on the, the dark bars are the original manuscripts and the light bars are the revisions. Um, that number on the right there is, I think, 439. Sorry, you can't read it. And this is the uh, monthly usage. You'll see that spike in June, which is one particular paper, which I can tell you about if you're interested. Um, there is a differential uptake of preprints. If you look at their separation across different disciplines, perhaps not surprisingly, down at the bottom there, the largest proportion are in the field of bioinformatics, followed by evolutionary biology, genomics, neuroscience, genetics, ecology. Um, this has changed in the past year, interestingly. If, this, if I'd shown you this a year ago, neuroscience would have been far back in the pack, but it is, ca it is rapidly catching up. Ecology is also seems to be on a bit of a, a tear at this point. It was inevitable that there would be a differential in, in take up. As I said, there are quants in fields like bioinformatics and genomics who know about archive and for whom a preprint is not a terribly terrifying thing. Um, this is exactly what happened with the archive. Going back to 1992, then all the preprints came from high energy physics. And then as the service expanded, you can see other branches of physics coming in and then mathematics and, and other things. And it's not unreasonable to suspect that this may happen with biology too. From an author's perspective, um, well, these are our conclusions. Um, people are putting exciting science on bioarchive. And one of the questions that we received at the beginning was, well, won't people just put you know, trivial stuff there? Well, it doesn't look like it uh, from what we can see. And if you look at the league table of submissions, then these are the top 10 institutions that have provided preprints to bioarchive. Stanford at the top, but look, Cambridge, um, Oxford, Edinburgh, <coughs> London, uh, Imperial, uh, University College London and Imperial College London. So five out of the top ten institutions that are supporting bioarchive are British. And I think that is a real tribute to the uh, efforts towards open science that have, been, that have been made here. As far as feedback is concerned, I mean, one of the rationales for a preprint service is so that as an author you can hear from your community. So this happens through a variety of means. There are blogs devoted to individual disciplines. Um, we have direct commenting on the site. Uh, at the moment, 11% of manuscripts have comments, sometimes extensive, sometimes not. Um, that doesn't seem like a lot. But by comparison with the conventional journal, it's a great deal. So there is something, we think, that is attractive to the community about being able to comment on a preprint, perhaps it's the sense that this is a work that's still progressing and that there is some value to communicating with the author at, at that stage as opposed to a published paper when basically everybody has sort of moved on. Something that's been immensely important to BioArchive is Twitter. Uh, not so much <coughs> Facebook, but um, I don't think you can read that down in the corner, that 93K number. That is the number of tweets around BioArchive in the past 12 months. It's a, an enormous number. And again, some of these are simply referencing a manuscript. Sometimes there are full-blown discussions of what results are in a particular paper conducted through the medium of 140 characters. Um, people are sometimes very good at that. Um, 
One thing we know happens a great deal is the direct and private feedback to authors through email or through conversations at meetings like this. Um, the, we would love to have that exposed in some way, but I think there's still some anxiety about communicating about these things in public. Um, we're interested in new ways of, of uh, improving the sort of public commenting on preprints. We're not very pleased with the commenting technology that we have at the moment and are looking at some options and there are discussions about how that kind of thing might improve across, across the <coughs> industry, actually. Meanwhile, there are changes in other, in other respects, in other parts of the, the publishing or the communication ecosystem. Uh, the National Institutes of Health put out this request for information just uh, last month. They, um, they love to call a preprint um, an interim research product, um, which I think uh, they need to do something about, about that term. But anyway, they, they are concerned not just about preprints, but about <laughs> research um, registered reports. You know, the idea that you send a journal what you are going to do and get a commitment from the journal that they will publish uh, whatever it is that emerges from that investigation. That's an, another kind of communication that is a minor component at this point, but lots of people are interested in. So they're looking for comment from stakeholders, from, from scientists, from all kinds of people to help them think through how they're going to change their policies about grants to embrace preprints in some way. So we don't know exactly how that's going to go, but it's likely that they will change in the direction of being more favorably disposed to the idea that you can use a preprint to support your grant renewal or your grant application. Um, institutions themselves that give jobs to people are very important in this process, and that too is beginning to change, perhaps less obviously, but here's a tweet from a faculty member at Rockefeller who's proudly pointing to the fact that they are interviewing candidates for a faculty job who have produced preprints as evidence of their, their worth. And the tweet on the right is from the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative. Uh, Simons Foundation has been very important to the idea of preprints. They, su they, they support the archive and have done for years. And here they are coming out and saying, we, we support preprints in the life sciences and our committees will look at preprints in support of grant applications. So these things are all going in the right direction, and so is publication. Just in the past year or two, many, many more journals have made abundantly clear that they will consider for publication manuscripts that have been put on preprint servers. And there is a very wide range of choice now if you wish to submit your manuscript to one of these, or one of these journals, and they include some of the, the, more, the most prominent. Um, we have developed the facility within BioArchive to submit a manuscript directly to a journal um, with one click, we say, and that's pretty much how it works. Um, we began with a small group as a test. It proved to be successful. Now we have 50 plus journals on that list, and there are many more to come. Um, that seems, to, and we've had um, between two and 300 manuscripts be transferred that way just in the past few months. This expansion of this scheme really only happened uh, in the spring. We also have uh, the ability to w work with journals in such a way that the journal can say to you as an author, once you've sent us your manuscript, would you also like to deposit it on BioArchive? That's a small group. We're working on the technology to expand that group, and that too seems to be a promising avenue. Um, this is just a sort of diagrammatic uh, version of what I've just told you. There's the list of journals on the right, one-click submission. Um, and we are now seeing the beginnings of further integration with journals in the form of active recruitment from, uh, from BioArchive to journals. Editors specifically looking at what has been posted, contacting authors and saying, we're very interested in this work, would you like to submit it? And this tweet uh, on the right here from Hopi Hoekstra um, announces that 
Plus Genetics have appointed editors specifically for that um, recruitment purpose. So this um, taps into our sort of vision of BioArchive as a hub in the communication process. Their submission, both directly from authors and perhaps via journals, um, confirmatory and contradictory results address the, the issues of, of uh, reproducibility that is concerning uh, us all. Um, there's transfer to journals for the, the absolutely vital and necessary step of peer review and certification. And in the meantime, there is discussion going on through a variety of means. So at BioArchive at three, which it will be in a couple of weeks time, um, we have, as I've told you, rising submissions, rising usage. Um, in the past year, we have expanded the coverage very tentatively in the direction of clinical medicine, first steps being clinical trials and epidemiology, and that's something we might want to talk a bit about more. We now have funding from the foundations, as well as great support from the laboratory. And this um, alphabet soup down here at the bottom is some, just some of the organizations who have been kind enough and willing enough to work with us on this question of integration. And um, those, <coughs> those uh, initials down at the bottom there include the company of biologists, from whom you are going to hear, and eLife, from whom you are going to hear. And, uh, I have no idea what they're going to say, but I hope their experience has been favorable. Um, we're very grateful to them for that, uh, for that support. Um, our priorities are to expand this idea of the hub in a whole variety of ways, maybe add other options for authors, which might include this question of independent peer review services, developing APIs so that other people can do stuff with the content of BioArchive. I'm not quite sure what people want to do yet, but, but IP APIs are on our agenda. We have developed what we call channels, which are essentially curated collections around a particular theme which I can talk about more if you're interested. I mentioned clinical research. We continue to you know, advocate for preprints with organizations, publishers, and so on. And we're always looking at our technology to see that we have the best that we can do. Um, we are also engaged with, as many people are, in a, an ongoing conversation where we're stimulated by the ASAP bio organization that Alfonso referred to in his opening remarks, um, they are catalyzing a conversation with a group of funders who are asking themselves, what do preprints mean for us? And that conversation is quite complex. It's swirling around issues of governance, who runs a service, who runs a preprint service, um, our open source technologies, uh, uh, a requirement or simply a recommendation, uh, APIs I've mentioned, the question of content licensing, this, the idea that the author has a wide range to choose from, um, there's conversation about whether there should be more restriction in those licensing. There's also conversation about whether preprints deserve a full text XML representation uh, and not just manifestation of PDF as I mentioned, and some of this is giving rise to the thought that there may need to be a centralized service that pulls together information or the actual content of preprints from a variety of sources. That conversation is ongoing. Um, we could talk about that in more detail if you, if you wish. There are a lot of unanswered questions about preprints, and some of them I'm sure will come up in the conversation this afternoon. The question of priority, which is so important for many people, is something that we can't legislate. And my sense is that it's going to be sorted out on a discipline by discipline basis. And what happens, for example, in bioinformatics may not be what happens in cancer research. Um, there is the question of citations. And um, the bioarchive has now been around long enough for there to be citations for preprints. And the question is how, for, as from an author's perspective, you want to know uh, what citing, citation practice is going on around your work, whether it exists as a preprint or exists as a publication. And so there are, there's conversation about technological solutions to that. 
Um, the issue of discoverability that I mentioned in the beginning, actually there are some emerging and very good tools for finding preprints in different locations. The question of retractions is a tricky one. You know, what happens if somebody wants to retract a preprint? What happens if a journal retracts a paper that has a link to it from a preprint? We need to deal with these things. And the license conflicts, that really refers to the idea that it is possible to, for you to have a license for a preprint which a journal does not want. You know, if the journal asks you to transfer a copyright, but you have put, for example, put a CC BY license on your manuscript, then there is an issue there that needs to be worked out. So we are still in the, in many ways, in the early days of managing preprints. In the meantime, though, there is a growing enthusiasm for preprints in other parts of the scholarly uh, ecosystem. Uh, there is the beginnings of two services, social the Social Archive for Social Services and the Sci Archive for Psychology, and um, recently advertised but not um, yet visible or created is one for chemistry. There is also, I should point out, that you know the, this archive model is not the only way in which preprints can be uh, made available. There is another model, um, perhaps already familiar to you, in which uh, an author submits a preprint to a journal, an open access journal typically, and the journal makes that preprint publicly available. There's a period of comment. There's also a period of peer review, and the journal then publishes the papers that, that pass peer review. And the economic model for that is not foundation support, but the article publication charges that authors pay for the published papers. So this was actually pioneered quite a few years ago by a German um, chemistry, atmospheric chemistry and physics uh, journal, but was taken up much more prominently by the fa by faculty of a thousand research and by Pierre J, both of which I'm sure you're quite familiar with. And just uh, a few days ago, Jessica Polker, who is the director of ASAP Bio, assembled very useful this very useful assembly of data of, of statistics showing the growth of preprints in the life sciences per month from January 2003 to, through to uh, July of this year. The purple color shows uh, the number of submissions to the quantitative biology section of archive, and you can see the, what we detected back in 2012. You can see an uptick in the submission rate. Um, the greenish, bluish uh, color to the far right there, that's bioarchive. And you can see Pia J in there, you can see Faculty of a Thousand in there. And also, interestingly, you can see in red, you can see the period during which nature preceded its function from 2006 to 2012. Um, so this is, this is sort of, uh, I think, very good evidence that there is indeed, as Alfonso said, an increasing amount of interest in this means of communication in biology. We are very delighted with what has happened so far. We're also extremely aware that there is a long way to go before this kind of preprint practice becomes centralized in biomedical communication. And we hope to participate and help in that process. So just a word of acknowledgement to my wonderful colleagues at Cold Spring Harbor, particularly Richard Sever, who may be listening to us from his sick bed in Brooklyn. So of course I have to say that, but I really mean it, Richard. Um, and my colleagues who basically keep this service going. Um, you know, it's a, the service is a 24 seven service. It's very hard work. And uh, there are people involved in screening and technology development who really are essential to whatever we have accomplished. I also want to shout, uh, shout out to the archive, uh, bioarchive affiliates, who are the people who are so important, as I said, in telling us that it's okay to post this particular manuscript. And also we have an advisory group who were particularly important in helping us as we were thinking through how to do this uh, right back at the beginning. And we have Frank Norman from the Crick here, who was a, a, a very valued member of that, of that particular group. Highwire Press are our technology hosts, and they have provided absolutely rock-solid support for submission and for hosting. 
Um, I'm very grateful to these organizations, the societies, the publishers, and others who have helped us with this idea of integration. And then, of course, the laboratory and the Lurie Foundation for financial support. But in particular, I think I'd like to thank the authors who took a chance on BioArchive starting three years ago. People who gave us their work, people who were prepared to read that work, contribute to the download figures, people who have commented on preprints in all kinds of contexts, and people who are supporting preprints and continue to do that in many different places, locations, and organizations. So thank you very much to all of them, and thanks to you for listening to me talk rather too long. Because I left? <laughs> <laughs> because you left me. Thank you. <laughs>
Well, why do we support preprints? And I think there are basically three kinds of reasons, uh, and this is, you know, some of it, this has been covered by John, so I don't need to go into this in, in great detail. But the first point is that we just don't think we should get in the way. We should facilitate this process because that's what journals should be about. Um, so, if, in other words, if scientists want to communicate their work via preprints, then we should encourage and facilitate that. The reasons to do that, I think all of these reasons have been covered by John, so I don't need to go through this slide at all. Obviously, John's talked about the tool that, that's been introduced that is in, being incredibly effective in terms of providing the mechanism to do this in biology, um, and then there's this really important grassroots initiative called ASAP Bio that has, I think, you know, fueled interest in the, whole, uh, in the whole thing. So you can see, actually, you can see the change that occurred when uh, at the beginning of the year when ASAP Bio uh, started those conversations. So, so those two things are working together. Um, so we don't want to get in the way, and actually we do want to support the use of preprints. So the way in which we do that is we are one of the journals that participates in the direct submission. So you can submit to uh, BioArchive and then press the button and it, uh, it, it comes to eLife and we receive around 10 uh, submissions a month using that route. We want to go in the opposite direction as well because we're, you know, we're receiving around 700 submissions a month. Um, we, we, we may or, we, we're not sure at what stage we would encourage people or have a button which allows then the, the submission of that uh, work to BioArchive. But, uh, but we do want to put that in place and hopefully that technology will be ready sometime early in 2017. We've issued joint statements as part of the sort of advocacy effort to support this idea, to make it very clear that journals are supportive of, uh, of preprint deposition. So we got together with the Royal Society, PLOS and EMBO on that. And we also work with and support other related systems. And ORCID's an example, so that you know, if, you, if you have an ORCID, you use that in your submission to, to BioArchive, for example, then your ORCID record is automatically updated. Just as a matter of interest, how many people have an ORCID in the room? Not bad, could be better though. So, uh, so uh, you know, encourage you to, to go and get one. This is your unique identifier. It allows you to then associate yourself uniquely with a, with a, with a set of research outputs. So it's a, 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 an important tool. So second reason that we don't want to get in the way but also journals and preprints very much complement one another. So these are some of the things that journals do top of the, that, that preprints don't do. So top of the list would be peer review. Um, now, you know, that, uh, there are certainly critics of peer review. It is regarded as a gold standard. It is certainly not a perfect process, as this little cartoon is, uh, is illustrating. But the idea is that you provide some expert evaluation and some improvement of the article, and that's what pre uh, frequently happens. But also additional quality control checks are provided by journals. There are, there's a lot of content processing. So there's copy editing, for example. There is the, the generation of beautifully structured XML, which supports all sorts of downstream activities, and so on. There is the important issue of branding. Now, there's again, there's a lot of debate about just how important this issue, how important the journal brand that is associated with a paper should be. Many people argue that it's, it's gone way too far and that journal brands count for far too much in terms of the evaluation of science. Nevertheless, there is, there, that is an important function currently that journals provide. And there are other kinds of value that uh, are added by journals, such as, for example, the provision of, of additional content, non-technical summaries and so on. Promotion and discoverability is another thing that journals do. Now, there's a really interesting uh, discussion about the issue of scientific priority which uh, John touched on. And this, was, uh, this is actually an article that was, that was published in, in eLife by Ron Vale, who was one of the people behind ASAP Bio and Tony Hyman. And they were talking about the issue of, of scientific dis uh, priority, and they divided it into sort of two, two components. The first component is the, is the disclosure component. And so they were arguing that actually preprints are a great way to disclose content, to disclose work, and disclose it early. And then then the separate, uh, the separate step is the validation step, and that can be provided by journals via peer review or, and post-publication peer review mechanisms as well. You know, currently, this business of scientific priority is all wrapped up in a single journal publishing process. That's the way it has worked. So they're arguing for disaggregating these two functions, and, and that's where preprints could really help. 
uh, the point at which priority is established uh, will vary, as John says, I think, um, depending on the field and, and probably depending even on the paper. So, uh, so journals and preprints can work together very effectively. And then the last point I want to make is, uh, is that I think another exciting thing about preprints is that new possibilities can arise as a result of preprints. So I want to just mention some of those possibilities. So um, I was involved, actually, in, I was an author on a preprint that we deposited in uh, July in BioArchive. And uh, this was a collaboration with Nature Science, EMBO, PLOS, Royal Society, and two academics, Stephen Curry and Vincent LaRiviere. And it's a very simple uh, idea. The idea was we just want to come up with a simple method that other journals could use to expose the citation distributions that underlie the calculation of the impact factor. And the point we were trying to make is that these distributions are broad, they are overlapping, uh, regardless of the impact factor, and therefore the impact factor is really a lousy metric to use to judge the potential importance of an individual paper which could lie anywhere, obviously, within that distribution. So that was the point of the paper. But what happened was really interesting. So we put this on BioArchive and we got tons of comments from the community in blogs, on Twitter, on the paper itself. And, uh, and, uh, and that really felt like a very extensive form of community peer review. So Stephen Curry did a, a, a wonderful job of then assimilating and consolidating all those comments into a list. We revised the paper as a result. He, he produced this very clear summary of how we revised the paper in light of all the comments, so much in the same way as you would do in response to peer review, and then published all that stuff as a revision of the article. And we thought, well, actually, that's enough. We don't need to go any further. We don't need to go through uh, the pain of publishing it in the peer review journal because it has been peer reviewed, uh, 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 you know, as far as we're concerned. And so it, the information's all out there and people can make up their own mind. So that's what we did. And maybe that would be enough, actually, for quite a lot of papers. Maybe that would be quite sufficient, um, that form of, uh, of communication. But if you do want to do peer review, then another, something else that John hinted at that could be possible is that you could overlay the peer review process on top of the preprint server. And this has been done in the, in the physics archive. So Tim Gowers, who will be familiar to many of you, a very famous mathematician here in Cambridge, established a journal called Discrete Analysis. And the idea of Discrete Analysis is it's built on top of archive. So the, 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 the articles are submitted as preprints to archive and then, and, then, and then sent to for editorial evaluation to Discrete Analysis. It has a very pretty front page, as you can see. Uh, the schools for editorial, editorial evaluation and peer review are provided by uh, something called Scholastica. And then the revision, the revised manuscript, is posted back on archive. So there, is it, there it is. So there's the archive record for this paper. It shows when it was first submitted, when it was revised, and the fact that it's been published in discrete analysis. So that's re another really interesting use of a preprint server. And it provides those functions of, 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 of disclosure and validation in much the same way as, 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 as a journal would. So that's potentially a very interesting uh, model which could be uh, 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 extended. And so here's, here's you know, my sort of pipe dream, I suppose, for how the things maybe could be taken further. And again, it, it, it follows on from some of the points that John made. So the idea is you, you submit your preprint to the preprint archive. There can be additional quality control functions provided there. They may vary depending on the field of the work. Um, uh, and then there could be a uh, content processing step which generates beautifully formatted XML from whatever's been submitted. You can then add value to the preprints in a way you cannot add value to PDFs. I would say, you know, there will be a strong motivation to use a CC BY license for all of this in order to ensure the most effective reuse of that content and allow all this value to be added. The peer review can then take place on top of that content. That content itself can be revised and a new version can be posted. So everything happens on this single server. Um, so I think that's, again, a, a pretty enticing model. We're somewhat, uh, you know, we're not there yet. Um, but um, you could imagine, you know, communities of reviewers, communities, sort of editorial boards, um, uh, evaluating work in that way on a preprint. This is very connected with uh, the, the uh, F1000 research. It is quite similar to the F1000 research model. And I think Hannah will be saying a little bit more about that in the Wellcome, from the Wellcome Trust. 
so that's, uh, I think, all I wanted to say. So th in summary, um, you know, our feeling at eLife, and you know, we have a, a, an editorial board of 300 scientific editors, you know, the, the, the feeling is very supportive around the use of preprints and the fact that it is very good for science um, and scientists. That, you know, these, it's very compatible, the, the compatibility between uh, uh, journals uh, and preprints. We could certainly go a lot further than we have gone so far. Um, what's important to help fuel this, this, this momentum is that journals, institutions and funders all recognise preprints as citable research first-class objects. And so that's, that's me done. Thank you. Model. The company about it, this is Catherine Brown, whom some of you might know from development. Yep. And um, I think, as usual, if you agree, you can say you agree, but I'm sure you will have some new things to say. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm Catherine Brown, I'm the executive editor of development, so I hope most of you are familiar with the company Biologist. Just a really brief, literally one or two slides. So we are a not for profit publisher run by distinguishing practicing scientists, unlike eLife, we've been around a long time, we've been around since 1925, and so I think as a result of that we've been rather more probably conservative and a little slower to change than perhaps eLife's revolutionary approach. But like eLife, what we're all about is supporting the biological community, um, and that's sort of summed up by our strap line, supporting biologists and spine biology. We run five journals, um, Development Journal of Cell Science and Journal of Experimental Biology have all been around a very long time. They're hybrid model journals, meaning that they're subscription journals with an open access option. And then we have two new journals, Disease Models and Mechanisms and Biology Open, which are, as I said, fully uh, gold open access. And in addition to running journals, what we're really about as an organisation, as I say, is supporting the community. And so we have a number of charitable activities. Um, we provide lots of grants to, uh, to help people to run meetings, um, travel grants for young researchers wanting to do collaborative visits or attend meetings. Um, we run our own set of, of workshops and we also support and fund a bunch of research societies. And what's really important about everything that we do is that it's very much driven by the community and by what we feel and what we, we are told um, the community wants. And you'll see that as I come to talk about preprints, as we've slowly adopted preprints or as we've adopted preprints, that's sort of been done at different, um, different speeds for different journals according to what, the, what those communities were, were sort of asking us for. So what are the company's preprint policies? I'm going to be a little more sort of down to earth than perhaps what, um, what Mark was just talking about, just talk through how we've really adopted that because it has come about and I think how it's come about has been quite interesting. So before BioArchive um, launched, the company policy was the deposition on a preprint server, there were preprint servers out there, and our policy was that if you deposited on a preprint server, that counted as prior publication and therefore you couldn't then submit it to a company, a biologist journal. And then BioArchive, started in November uh, 2013 and we thought that actually and we we knew the people launching BioArchive quite well um, Richard Sever had worked for the company for many years and so we were sort of talking to them and it actually as as John said it did feel like there was a changing tide in what people felt about by, about preprints and so we thought we'd better think again about what our policies were and so at the next board meeting um, in February 2014 um, the company board decided that each journal should then be allowed to set its own policy. This is the way the company typically works, is that the journal editors-in-chief and the journal editors have quite a lot of power to decide what each journal wants to do, and the company sort of lets them do what they think they should do. So in February 2014, the company decided that each journal could do what it wanted. Pretty rapidly after that, um, Development and Biology Open therefore decided that we would support and, and allow... Um, preprint deposition and this would no longer count as um, as a prior publication and actually pretty rapidly after that at the next development editors meeting the development editors actually got very keen about preprints and decided that we should do a lot more than that and we should really engage with it and this was sort of also um, John came to visit us and talked to us about about bioarchive and so in October 2014 um, I say it's quite quickly, that's quite quick for us, it probably sounds quite slow, um, but given that our editors only meet once a year and our board only meets every quarter or so, this, everything takes some time. So in October 2014, we started discussions with BioArchive about integration, both in both directions at the time, um, the, only op the only possible integration sort of um, technologically was from the journal to, to BioArchive, which is the B2J um, 
but I'll come to that in a second. And at the same, around the same time, DMM decided that they would also allow a preprint deposition. Took quite a long time to get this in place. So in September 2015, we then launched the what, what's known as the J2B portal, so the Journal to Bio Archive portal, so that when um, an author submits to development, they are they can then automatically deposit their paper in BioArchive with basically no further effort. So they don't need to go to both sites and deposit in both places. And I'll give you some of the stats on how many people are doing that in a minute. Um, so that started in September 2015. Uh, in January 2016, the Journal of Cell Science allowed preprint deposition, and in March 2016, JEB, the final journal, allowed preprint deposition. Now these were these were quite slow to adopt it. But that was based on a lot of discussion at pretty much every editor's meeting they were having and when they were going out and talking to the community about how much the communities for those journals actually felt like they really wanted preprints and they cared about preprints. And um, certainly for, for those two communities, um, and certainly for Journal of Experimental Biology, there has, still isn't a huge amount of enthusiasm um, for preprint servers, but they're now, they're now open to it. Um, journal of Cell Science was um, probably a bit more support for it, um, but that came in in January 2016. And actually, oh, so um, so then in June 2016, what um, what we also started doing was we realised that there are several preprint servers, and some of them are very good at actually categorising papers. So as as John said, in in BioArchive you can go and you can click on all the things that are developmental biology, but this is author collated, and actually there are quite a lot of developmental biology relevant papers in other categories in BioArchive, and there are also other preprint servers out there. So how can we make it easy for our community? to find those papers relevant to us. Um, we run a community blog called The Node, which some of you may know, and we actually therefore started trawling the preprint literature and posting every month, here are all the preprints that we can find on all of the different preprint servers in the developmental biology literature to try and provide a source and a way of collating things so that developmental biologists only need to go to one place to find all of their preprints and not to multiple places. And that's been a really popular um, innovation and that's getting a lot, of, a lot of reads and a lot of use. And then the final thing is that hopefully in, on November the 15th, um, it's taken a while to, to get there, but we're hoping that next month, um, but we're pretty sure that next month, all of the company of biologist journals should have the portals working in both directions. So both when you submit to, the, to each of the journals, you'll then be able to automatically deposit into BioArchive, or conversely, as Mark already said for eLife, when you submit to BioArchive, you'll be able to then automatically upload to any of the company journals. I'm not sure it's quite as easy as a one-click transfer, um, but it should certainly ease the process and make it quite a lot easier. And so I think, you know, in, in three years, we've come a long way in terms of what we think about preprints. As a company, we are fully behind um, preprints deposition for exactly the reason that Mark's already talked about, and I'm not going to go through that again. We do have a few um, policies and caveats about this. This is just taken from developments... Um, guide to authors, so we're basically we're very happy about for you to do it, but what we're not happy for you to do is um, to put up versions of a manuscript that have altered as the, a result of the review process. And the reason that we say that is that that's where we're actually spending money and time and effort, and if you can post your final author-accepted version on a, on a preprint server, um, there are a lot of other things that we do post-acceptance, but we've already invested a lot of money into that paper, and so we don't allow you to put those versions up. We only allow you to put the initial submitted version up. Um, we also just ask you to tell us that you've done it, so that we're aware that it's there, and we can you know, look at any comments that might be on there and so, far, so forth. Um, I think this is actually done automatically, so we can probably take it off our guide to authors, that um, the, the bio-archive thing is, is updated when the paper is published. And we also ask that, again, the review-type articles aren't posted on BioArchive, and again we do that because we put an awful lot, we commission almost all of our reviews, and we put an awful lot of time and, money and, and investment into, into producing those, so we ask that they're not posted on BioArchive. And then finally, the, uh, um, the, thing, the other thing we do, and it'd you know, be interesting to get people's feedback on that, is when we actually, in a published paper, when an author cites a preprint, which they're perfectly welcome to do, we actually code that so that the reader knows that it was a preprint and therefore not peer-reviewed, um, and therefore, perhaps, whatever that information, you may want to treat that with a little bit of caution. And so we actually flag that in the text of the paper so that a reader instantly knows that. Um, and I'd be interested to know what people with sort of different opinions on whether or not we should be doing that. So should we be treating a preprint differently to a published paper um, or to a peer-reviewed paper? Um, and I'd be interested in your feedback on that. So how many people are using it? 
Answer, not very many. Um, this is Development's uh, J2B portal, which, as I said, we launched in September 2015. And to date, we've only had 30 papers transferred from the journal to BioArchive. By comparison, that actually does represent about 40% of the developmental biology papers in BioArchive. So it sort of depends on how you look at it. I think it's 3% of total submissions. I, th I find that a little disappointing, to be honest. I would like to see more people using it, particularly given how easy I think we make it um, for people to do it. So obviously there are people putting papers on BioArchive that are published in development doing it independently of our portal, but the numbers are really, really quite low. And while we had a sort of spike earlier this year, so the last time I actually downloaded this data was in May, and I went, ooh, they're really starting to take off, and then it kind of tailed off again over the summer. So, you know, as I said, we still think it's valuable, and that's why we're doing it for all of the rest of our journals, but it is still a very much a, a minority activity. Of those papers that have been transferred, we've now published eight of those. Uh, we've still got four under consideration, and the rest of those um, we've rejected, so I don't know what's, what's happened to those. Um, but as I say, it, it represents quite a large proportion of bioarchives developmental biology content, but a very small proportion of our content. Um, and it would be really interesting to track this to see how it goes. And similarly, it would be really interesting to see what the effects of integrating in the, re the reverse direction um, will be. So just a few comments on sort of how preprints should work and what, what that we're currently doing and where. And actually, I've just got a load of questions for you guys to talk about, things I'm interested in finding out. So at the moment, um, this is sort of me talking to, to the community and what I think. Preprints are very much the, the bioarchive is the dominant server um, in the field. There are other ones out there, but people are really using bioarchive. But they're only used by a minority of researchers. I think most people, at least in the, in the States, perhaps more than in Europe, are now familiar with what a preprint is, um, although there's still um, some way to go. Authors tend to deposit to a preprint server at the time of submission or later. They're not really using it to gain comments before they submit to a journal. And actually, some are even just posting at the time of acceptance. And you see that a paper will go up on, pre on, on BioArchive and then two weeks later come out in a journal. Um, and they're doing it, as has been said, they're doing it to get the results out to the community earlier. And in some cases that I, that I know of, to sort of try and claim precedence in particularly competitive situations. And that, I think, when they're doing it late... Um, is sometimes why they're doing it. Um, I see very little commenting on preprints. I was actually surprised that the, the number is as high as 11%. That may be field specific. I only ever really look at the developmental biology ones, and there it's very low. And so I don't think that's, that's really taking off at this point, at least where I see it. So I think the things that I'm sort of interested in talking about out of this meeting is, you know, as we've already talked about, what are people's motivations for using preprints? What problems are we trying to solve with them? And to put these things a bit more specifically, is um, sort of questions is, when do we, when should we be depositing something to a preprint server, and what's, what are we trying to get out of it in, in those terms? Should editors be searching through preprint servers and uh, soliciting um, potential submissions? As I said, that this is already happening with with Plus Genetics quite officially. Um, David Drubin from MBOC has also been um, sort of tweeting about the fact that he's doing this. And then a whole bunch of, of issues around precedence and scooping and so on. So what do they mean for, for precedence? Do we, will researchers um, claim precedence through deposition of preliminary data? And is this, a, is this a problem? I think data and material sharing is a really interesting question. So if you've deposited on, on bioarchive, does that mean you should now be making your materials and your data available to the community? Or does that only come with formal publication? What about patent applications? And could you have your patent application scooped by a preprint? What about press embargoes, things like this? So can you have a press embargo on a paper that's already been put on a preprint server? Um, is there a, data, a danger in making unreviewed data publicly available? I think the clinical research is really where this is a potential issue um, and an interesting one to explore. Um, might commenting on preprints complement or even replace traditional peer review? I think it could happen, but we're certainly not there yet because people aren't really using it. Um, and what about, you know, at the moment we have one dominant preprint server, is this the way it should be in the same way as Archive? There are talks of other people starting preprint servers, is that a good thing? Do we want competition um, or not? And I think there's a whole bunch of questions. I think, as I say, I think preprints are here to stay and are now a part of our publishing landscape. But I think there's a whole lot of unresolved questions that we still need to, to think about, about where we're going to use them and what we're going to do with them. And I'm done. Thank you. engaging in a discussion and trying to address some of the questions that Catherine has said. I think it would be very good to hear 
to be used to find this, because in a way that's the other part that perhaps the most understood. And I think the work of international film has, said, has been very proactive, uh, not only to realize, but also to some recent policies. And we're very pleased to have Hannah Hope here today to give us their view. Don't forget the questions that, that have been asked. So that you can see there are some things that are repeating themselves. Another is important thing, because of course you all um, we all have applications for fellowships. Uh, the Welcome Trust figure is very prominently in our heads and in our pockets. So, okay. Um, so thank you very much, Alfonso, for inviting me to speak here about what Welcome is doing about preprints. So for those that don't know, Welcome is a funder whose aim is to improve health, and our goal is to invest £5 billion pounds over the next five years in doing this. Um, so... What do we think about preprints? I was working on the assumption that everyone else would have covered the introduction, so I'm skipping straight in to what we think. And it's, it's you know, we, th we think we like them. We believe that they increase the speed at which research findings are made more available, allow more rapid assessment, remove some publication bias. This is something that Mark mentioned around the branding of journals um, and the the, the way that that's used in measuring um, research value. And they present an op opportunity potentially to be a fully open publication type. So what are we doing? Um, so we want to support the uptake of preprints within the life sciences. We've heard that uptake currently is relatively low, um, and we would like to help um, improve that. And we are trying currently to build preprints into our reward system. So that is allowing researchers to cite preprints in grant and fellowship applications, and also in citing them when they're doing end of grant reporting um, to include preprints. We have also, um, and this is something that I, Catherine mentioned, about um, the coding of preprints. So we have asked as part of this work currently, that preprints are cited differently. So I'd be really interested in coming back to that question as well to find out what people think. Um, we're just awaiting final sign-off for this, uh, these changes to the application forms. So it should maybe come out at the end of this year. Um, so to be citable, we said that a preprint must have a DOI, it must be available from a public service or repository, and it must meet scholarly publication standards. So these are around uh, authorship, methods, ethical approval. And so we kind of have gone through some form of uh, basic screening, like John talked about, when papers are submitted to bioarchive. We've got some possible areas for future development, um, and that's around um, a requirement for Creative Commons licenses that support reuse um, for preprints that have been welcome funded to sort of go in line with our open access policy. Um, but that's not something that we're doing as, as an, at this initial stage. And then also um, we're interested, again, around the issue that Catherine raised of access to the data behind the preprint and the materials. Um, so that's, that's something that we're, we're not yet sure how to deal with. Um, alongside um, this, when it, we can actually get it approved, we will be publishing a statement to support to, and to acknowledge Welcome's support for preprints. Um, so everyone knows, the reviewers included, not just those being the applicants, that, that Welcome does believe in preprints. And then, I said I was going to be brief. Um, we're also working with other funders. So this is something that's been touched on, the work of Asset Bio and um, the community that they've gathered around preprints. And Wellcome's been working with other funders to understand the interest within, between funders and preprints, and there is significant interest in supporting the community-driven approach through Asset Bio um, to preprints. And as part of that, um, we've been involved in uh, developing a set of principles, we've called them, um, that 
seeks to provide guidance um, so that any services that may be built that funders might be asked to fund um, would support um, funders' collective goals. So these are goals centrally around um, discoverability, accessibility, um, interoperability, so mm -hmm. any systems and services put in place can be accessed and used and reused by others, um, tech, sort of, for example, in the text and data mining, um, but also reusability. And so that's, that's currently something that we're working on with other funders. Um, we will be sharing those with Asset Buyer. I believe the plan is to get that to them by the end of the year. Um, obviously, it depends on how long agreements uh, take to be reached. And that will hopefully support Asset Buyer's work that they're doing in trying to garner um, the services going forward. Now, so that's kind of a very whirlwind tour of what we're doing around preprints. I just wanted to mention a couple of other things that we've also been involved in. So you might have seen recently that we launched Welcome Open Research. So this is a platform for welcome-funded researchers to publish their research. Um, well, research, their, their research outputs, I guess we should say more broadly. We are removing, we don't have a specific paper format. Um, researchers can choose what they want to publish and when they publish it, it's got an, uh, an open system, it's post-publication peer review. It's based on the F1000 research platform, um, but we wanted to give uh, welcome, welcome support, I guess, to this, to this platform and to our funders, uh, fundees, to hopefully give them the confidence to um, branch out, I guess, in the way that they publish their research and to support them in doing that. Um, so that's open for submission now. Uh, the first articles will hopefully go live in a few weeks' time. And then we shall see how it goes from there. Um, so if there's any, any welcome-funded people in the audience and you'd like to know more, feel free to come and grab me. Um, I can tell you more about it. Um, the other areas that we're working on is around encouraging supported data sharing and reuse. And I mentioned that in terms of preprints, we weren't yet sure about this, um, but we're looking into this area more widely. And that re revolves around different areas. The reward idea as well for supporting and rewarding researchers for the time and effort that it requires to, to do this work, um, whether there's infrastructure that's required to support it and also training. And I just wanted to mention the Open Science Prize, which is one of the projects that we've been involved with, with the NIH and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, which has been around supporting six projects to um, do new things with publicly available research data. And that prize goes into the public voting phase on the 1st of December. So do look out for it and um, have your input on the data reuse project. And so that is all from me. So before, uh, I really want to thank everybody for having said, I'm going to take the, the prerogative of being the, the chairperson not to say anything. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very curious, because we have in the audience, and he was going to speak later, but maybe he can tell us. Like, we're very lucky to have Ray Goldstein, who is a, a card-carrying physicist who has straddled the two worlds of physics and biology. And sometimes I remember when we talk, it, it must feel very strange to you that we are discussing <laughs> the validity of, of, of preprints, that there is all this machinery. What is the perspective of the physicist on, the, on, on, on all this discussion? And you, you, you must feel a bit like an alien or that we are back 30 years. What is your view about these discussions? I mean, I should say that Ray is a, a very eminent physicist who is publishing in both worlds. And, and I think sometimes he's puzzled by what's happening in biology. So it'd be very helpful. He was going to speak later, but it'd be very interesting as an opening to the discussion to hear. Would you like me to come up and speak? Later? Yes, that, that would be fine. Um, after that introduction, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just continuity that is. Well, so um, first of all, I've, I've recently gotten off a, a plane from Chicago, so if I seem like I'm not quite here, I don't know why. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I'm a, a condensed matter physicist by training. Condensed matter means something like solid state physics, it used to mean 
Um, and I guess I started using the archive when I was simply doing physics probably 25 years ago, maybe more. Um, and I was always slightly unsure about how I felt of putting things on the archive. Um, but over the years, the more time went on and the more I realized that it had the benefits of being able to establish priority, et cetera, I overcome, overcame my, my hesitations about it. But you know, even within the physics community, there's a fair amount of uncertainty when it comes to certain kinds of papers, putting them on the archive. Now, maybe 20 years ago, I, I, I turned into doing biophysics. And although most of the work that we do in my group involves physicists and biologists in my group, and therefore I don't have to convince external biologists that putting things on the archive is a good thing, I do collaborate with external biologists. And I've had to have this discussion about, should we put it there, does the journal care, et cetera. And I think that it's, it's only heartening to see this advance coming into the biology world, because I really think that all the reasons we've heard outlined here, establishing priority, getting some feedback outside of the peer review system, accelerating the, the dissemination of results, all of these are the obvious reasons why putting things on the archive and archive is a good thing. And having said that, there are still papers I will not put on the archive until I know they're going to appear, or actually until they have appeared. Uh, because I know it's going to cause a big splash, and I don't want to—I don't want to lose that splash, uh, and I don't want to give away an idea that could be taken away from me without you know, me knowing. Because just because you submit it to a given journal doesn't mean it's going to get published there. You might spend the next six months going between journals trying to get it published. In the meantime, your ideas are out there, and. Um, and that, that's always been the worry, I think, for everybody. Now, of course, if, you, if you've got an enormously complicated experiment that you've done, nobody's going to just wake up tomorrow morning and, based on your paper, somehow redo it in, in three days and then put it on the archive and, and publish it. In some sense, that was a, never really an issue. Um, I, I, I wanted to relate one example of the way the archive can work independent of journals that I think is quite interesting. Those of you who pay a little attention to what goes on in the physics world might have heard about a possible new particle being discovered at CERN uh, in the last few months. It was known as the diphoton bump because there was some graph excess of signal somewhere, and, and this was thought to be possibly a new particle. And there was something like several hundred, if not 500, preprints that appeared on the High Energy Physics Archive in the next few months after the first paper got onto the archive saying there was this bump. All of them were totally irrelevant because <coughs> the bump was a statistical fluke and it went away. <laughs> and I don't know how many made it into journals. I would bet very few. But what you saw there was a, was a kind of scientific method uh, in action, independent of the journals, because there were all these ideas. The data was out there. The new data came. It disappeared. Everyone said, well, OK, tough luck. Uh, and the journals weren't in, on the action at all. And maybe that's a good thing. Uh, but so that can happen. Uh, and it can happen in a way that's independent of the journals. And you know, the high energy physics community has operated independent of journals for years. It's true that papers eventually find their way into journals. But if you look, for instance, just go on to archive.org, look under hep.th, which is the theoretical physics part of high energy physics. Just download an arbitrary uh, preprint. And most of the citations are basically archive 0753.1. You know, it's just archive numbers. End, endlessly. So, so it is basically a journal. Now, I don't think that's really in the best interest of the kind of interdisciplinary science that we're talking about here, because I think peer review does play a role. And in fact, I've just written a little commentary for Physics Today about the eLife peer review system, which I basically say this is the peer review system that we all want to use. Uh, because, because that ability to give feedback in an anonymous way uh, is, I've, I've seen it firsthand on both sides. It really does something special uh, when it works well. But in order to work well, it has to be structured the right way. And, uh, and so it's probably not possible to really disentangle the, the whole issue of archives and peer review. They, they really have to be thought of as two sides of the same thing. I don't know if that helps give a perspective. Yeah, which um, is, which is I, think, I think that it's good to hear the other side. I mean, Discovered something in biology. So I guess yeah, it, it's something that existed before. You are giving us yeah. an experience on the road testing of that, and I, and I have heard. 
two things. The physics is much smaller field than biology. Yes. Smaller, so, you said. So yeah. It, yeah. And, and therefore, if you unleash mm. things like the theoretical physics, which doesn't exist in biology, fortunately. Well, actually, really I had a, a comment about, sorry I came in slightly late to the first talk, but there was, there was a comment made by the first speaker about blue sky things being filtered out of the system. Yeah. And I was slightly puzzled. Maybe, maybe at some point you can comment yeah. on exactly what he meant by that. Um, so, you know, my morning routine is before I see how the election is going in the U.S., I, <laughs> I, I read uh, CONMAT on the archive, uh, on, the, on, the, on the physics archive, just to see what's there. But what you realize with all of this is that, for instance, when I put papers on the archive about our biophysics work, which subsection am I supposed to put it in? Okay, I cross-listed between soft condensed matter, which is which is a popular place to put it, and the Q-bio Q part of it. And I have to remember you know, which, which sections am I going to check to make sure I catch everything. Now there are, I don't know, three or four bio-archive-like things. And so I'm thinking, we're just recreating, possibly, the same problem that we have about which journals am I supposed to look in to find the latest papers. And, and so I was wondering about why there isn't some effort to make all these archives a single archive. Uh, and that, I think, could be uh, advantageous uh, to a lot of people. I think that's open to the discussion, which we have for a few minutes, which we're going to have. Um, but I, I hope that uh, it's being caught, the, the discussion is being caught without going to the microphone. Would you like to answer that question, John? The question of the single yes. versus the multiple yeah. search? Sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, I am a highly partial commentator on this issue. And um, many people are close to that. But I agree with you completely for exactly the reason that you said. And um, that I keep hearing that there are going to be additional um, preprint servers in biology. Um, there are other uh, sources of preprints, as I showed in my final slide. And I didn't cover you know, quite all of them, um, that do things in slightly different ways. Um, but I think from the perspective of the community, what we have seen with journals is this tremendous explosion and diversification of journals, particularly in the last 10 years. And that has added to the difficulty of managing scientific information. And our feeling, regardless of whether we are promoting our service or not, but our feeling that if biology can manage a central service, with tools that are built around it in all kinds of ways that help with discovery um, and, uh, and tagging and so on, then um, I believe the community will benefit most from that approach. However, not everybody necessarily agrees with that. And the question also is whether you have um, a service that provides discovery, uh, a central service that provides discovery, or whether you have a central service that provides content. And those are two separate kinds of things. Well, there's, that's a good point. Uh, for instance, um, it's obviously the case that, that when one is submitting a paper, say, to eLife, which has the capability of having video and everything embedded in it, that if you were to put that submission on the archive, which we do, you can't put everything there because the current archive actually has, I don't know exactly how big the limit is. They don't quite divulge it. But it's easy to bump up against that limit, especially with large videos and things yeah. like that. And so you have to just say in the comments section, well, video is available from the author, just ask. And so it's acting as more of an announcement than it is an archiving service in the literal sense for everything that's there. But that, I think, is just a historical consequence of the fact that originally the archive was a, a PC under Paul Ginsburg's desk yes. in, in Los Alamos. I think I've even seen that. Yeah. And so, but, um, the one thing I want to also ask, which, which I, I didn't know about BioArchive, is this approval process where some member of the mysterious board uh, actually allows it. And although there's some kind of monitoring on the archive, uh, it doesn't take a formal form like that. Well, I wouldn't call what, I mean, I would never call it approval. I would call it screening. screening. And the, the purpose of it is to eliminate, not to approve. You know, it's just to, um, to, if 
it, it's you know the, the instructions that have developed for this group of affiliates have evolved over the period of the three years of the service. And, and we made, as I think I tried to say at the beginning, perhaps before you came in, we made some very pragmatic decisions at the beginning designed to maximize the value, the immediately yeah. received value of the service. And let's face it, we, we've, all, we've all looked in our, in our shortage of time, we look at a source of content, and if we see what we consider to be crap, then we never go back there. And so what we tried to do was to avoid weighing down the service with um, with content that will not perceive to be valuable, will not be perceived to be useful to the community. And that required some compromises, and not everybody agrees with the choices that were made. And we can evolve those choices as time goes on. But to your point about um, my throwaway comment about blue sky hypothesis, so that was one of the decisions that we had to make. You know, could, would bioarchive be um, submerged with everybody's latest idea? They woke up this morning and thought, this is the answer, and wrote it down, and sent it to bioarchive. In our view, that would make the service less useful. That is not to say that it isn't a vehicle for hypotheses, but they should be hypotheses that have data associated with them. That's what I tried to say earlier, and said it very badly. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Did you, when you were considering this um, screening process, I, you must have considered the model that Archive had, which essentially doesn't screen individual submissions, but essentially requires users to be, um, uh, for your first submission, to be also ki um, uh, um, approved or whatever word yes. you want to choose by yes. another. Almost like a membership. Yes, exactly. And thereafter, you could submit without yes. screening out. So why did you did you think consider that, and why did you reject it? Um, we did consider that, and we felt that with a completely untried service, particularly one that was following in the heels of similar attempts that had failed, then the chances of getting people to sort of um, sign up to that quote membership type of model were less likely. So we have instead imposed on this uh, group of, of 60 uh, scientists the uh, responsibility for doing that kind of screening. But like I said, that was the first, that was yes. the first model. And it is scalable, because if you have many more manuscripts, you need many more than 60. But it may not be the ideal methodology, and uh, we are completely open to you know, how the service evolves. And you find, I mean, there are many questions about this, and you probably find me saying, we're completely open to how the thing's going to evolve, be evolve because we are, you know. And, um, uh, it, it, but I think that's a very good question, and that's, that's why we, we didn't uh, consider it straight out of the box. But I wanted to make a second point, which may be another. Well, it had to do with a comment made toward the end of the last set of <coughs> speakers about um, trying to make the submission turn into something visually more interesting, more like a journal. So in, in physics, um, since when I was a graduate student, so uh, mid 80s, we've all used uh, what's called RevTech. So it's, a, it's a, a version of LaTeX for physical review. That's why it's called RevTech. And it's, of course, gone to, to the point that nobody uses a secretary to type the paper anymore. We all just write everything in this environment, and it automatically looks exactly like people appear in the journal. And that's especially important for certain journals that have page limits. So you, you know exactly that it's in those page limits, and you're not going to take your 10% back because it's too long. But it also makes for a very visually uh, appealing uh, format, rather than you know, double space, Microsoft Word with the figures in the end and all that. I never know why the figures in the end. <laughs> but the point, <laughs> the point is that everybody uses it. You submit to the archive, it's got all the macros, and therefore you submit your latex source and the figures, and it compiles it, and, and you're done. But of course, you do that offline before anyway. So if there were a I don't know, biotech, <laughs> with an X, biotech uh, a version of this or something like that that everybody would, would use, then everybody could make it in a form that would be compatible with everything else. And then, and then we'd be on this problem automatically. And the authors would do all the work. So that, that, is, that is a great point. And, um, 
the fact is that in biology, some huge percentage of authors use Microsoft Word. And, and LaTeX has not. Oh, I know. I, I've tried to get some of my biologist friends to that. Don't worry, the next generation will. Yeah. And, and, the next generation and, will. and you know, it's not impossible that in a very short time, we will evolve to writing directly into XML, yeah. and then we will have solved that problem. But yeah, there is a lot of talk about translation from format to format and interfacing with a service like BioArchive. And I just had some conversations about that last week. Um, you know, there are lots of people interested in this problem. In fact, sure. Sure. And what the end point will be is, is, uh, is interesting. Um, can I ask you a question? Um, when we were doing our due diligence, period, um, one of the physicists that we talked to said <coughs> something that really stuck in my mind, which was, everybody uses, everybody reads and posts to the archive, but nobody ever got a job based on what they put there. And um, I thought that was quite striking. Would, could, could you confirm that? I mean, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. Let me make sure I understand how to interpret that, meaning, meaning that in other words, a paper that didn't get, get into a journal, for instance. Yes, you get a job based on what you published in the journal, not simply what you posted on the archive. Well, if you talk to the high energy physicists, they would tell you that everybody who gets a job to a first approximation published on the archive and could care less about the journal. So eventually it gets into a journal. But um, the time scale, for instance, in that community is such that if I once was talking to a string theorist and I said something about the well, I well, I've seen that paper on the archive about four or five months ago. He said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's ancient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so actually, I think the answer is probably there are people who've gotten jobs based on papers on the archive before the paper ever got published in the journal. I, I'm sure. I, but I guess sure. you know, that, that touches upon, and I think it'd be very interesting to hear from the, from the Wellcome Trust about what they've stated about their support. Yeah. I mean, biology and we'll physics. Have a we'll yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in that regard, in, 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 in that, thank you. In that regard, I, I hope you'll be quicker than, than Embo when Maria left in at the meeting in Washington and said, and I keep on asking her every, every two or three months, that, that the preprint will be admitted in the applications to Embo fellowships. And I keep on asking questions and I keep on preferring you to the video that you can see online. <laughs> saying that, it, that was six months ago. So maybe no, this no, video yeah. will be. There's also the issue of the ref. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are preprint yes. accessible? Yeah, but, yeah. but the important thing is, is also there are differences between physics and biology, and, and at the time that archive, and this is just part of the discussion, can in the great loss in biology for, for the post of that looking for a job trying to publish one of the things, the great loss is enormous. It's not what happens in the great loss, it's what happens in the process of peer review, which is the first author, becomes the second, becomes the third, after three years is acknowledged. So, so this is, this, this is, this is the, the problem, and this is why it is appreciated that understanding what it is. What do the people think? I mean, you know, we can have a conversation, but there is the students, there is courses, there is PIs. What do, what do they think? Should, should people, I mean, Ray has said something that has surprised me, but that I will leave that for a private conversation. And it's usually yeah. happy. But what, what do you think? Do you think, would, would you like, yes, would you like to do this? Can you speak a bit louder so that we can pick up? Sure, so I, I think this is really interesting. I have to say, so I guess I have two comments on this that might just be my own Category. He used the word splash. Exactly, yeah. Well, but it was a very particular kind of splash. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, for instance, we, we just submitted something to, to Eli, which um, we put up, we, we, we put it on 
the archive the day after he submitted it to Elon. And I think it's a very important paper, and, and I had no qualms about it. Uh, I knew anybody who wanted to try to redo the experiments would spend months doing it, and, and the theory part, you know, it's there. We plan priority for it, so there's nothing to worry about. Um, but if you write a paper about the shape of a ponytail, which you have, which I have, <laughs> uh, and and you really want to you know keep it quiet until it comes out, yeah, then 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 you don't worry about that. But that those are very special cases where you you, know, you can see why. <laughs> well, I just wanted to respond to your sort of first comment about the kind of confidence in the fact. One of the things I found quite interesting talking to people in, in my community, and particularly interviewed quite a lot by Olivia Jokia, editor in chief, who's taken up putting stuff on by our Yeah, he's suddenly so excited, he's very pro, pro free print. And he and and one of the things he says is he would be more careful about what something he puts onto a free print server than something that he puts than he submits to a journal for exactly that reason. So one of the things that I've been both sort of somewhat concerned about, about, for example, about opening up the bioarchive to journal portal, is would we suddenly get a whole, would we be flooded with submissions of rubbish papers um, that, that you know, just take up our time dealing with? Um, to which Olivier's response is no, because the vast majority of the community are going to be much more careful about what they put up on a free print server because they are risking their necks much more. And I think at this point, that is, is the case, and I'm sure there's bits and pieces of stuff on bioarchive that will never get published. Um, but I think that that is where most of you are going. Yeah. Um, I, I realized um, that I skipped over one um, element in, in my slides, which was that um, two years after posting, 60% of the manuscripts on bioarchive have appeared in the journal. And we, we, do, we know that because we create these links. So the interesting question is, well, what about the other 40%? And, and Mark alluded to one use case where, you know, the authors say, it's out there, it has done its job, um, we don't need to put it anywhere else. And I've heard similar comments from people in, in bioinformatics, for example, who may have a tool that they simply wanted to put out to the community and they make it available through a preprint server and that's all they feel they need to do. Um, because the, the validation of the tool is in whether it works in people's hands and what people do with it. So, um, but there are other, you know, there undoubtedly will be some uh, papers that, that don't progress into the published literature for a variety of reasons. Peter. So I was interested by Mark's point on um, the sort of two-step process of establishing priority through disclosure and validation. And so perhaps I politically imagine a not too distant future where publishing has been democratized to such an extent that authors now completely format their own paper in a journal style. They prepare their own figures professionally, or semi-professionally. They submit it, they distribute it through Twitter, and they get peer review from the community. Um, do you think, collectively, it's possible that um, preprint servers will be able to address this problem of validation, which currently remains only something that journals can really provide. So I think, I mean, the example I showed um, of discrete analysis, I, I, are you familiar with that? Just huh? slightly. Huh? Slightly. Yeah. So that does seem to be uh, addressing the, the, you know, the, 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 the um, model that you're talking about. Um, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be extended, you know, with different uh, different subject areas. Um, so um, yes, I think I think there's a lot of prospects, and and one of the great advantage of doing that is that then all of the content is in the same kind of format. And if in in this case, you know, the the, the, the formats are actually very very good and probably as good as what you see in the journal ultimately. Um, then you know you have really done a lot of it. You've provided a lot of the functions that the journal traditionally provides in one yeah. process, but you've, but, you've, mm -hmm. but, you've, but you've separated into those two things. And so in biology, um, but yeah, why, why couldn't the same thing work? Out of curiosity, there is a lot of users here. You know, they, one of the things, as, as that article by Tony Hyman and yeah. talks about, is this issue of validation. And they put the issue of validation, and, and I have to say, I wasn't very persuaded by, by, by the arguments put in that article. I just haven't had time to comment. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's if, the 
make the point because many, yeah. many, many people here are practitioners. How many of you have had the problem with validation of experiments that have been published in a journal and you try to repeat them and you cannot repeat them? Can you raise your hand or so have? So to me, this is, this is an interesting aspect when they say, you know, the journals provide validation. What they provide is the inability to answer to the inability to reproduce the results. And <laughs> so this, this, is, this is an issue that to me, I mean, that article is one of the failures of that issue. Validation is when people can reproduce what you do. And, uh, and a journal, a published journal can never provide validation. Validation is, is the, the community. This is a serious problem in biology, which, which I don't know whether the, the contrast is. I think when the Royal Society was first created, there were people who were assigned to reproduce experiments. Robert Hope was one of them. Well, in that regard, I see that I'm quite interested, you know, this divide between what we can offer in, you know, is it your face that is out there and I think there's something wrong? Sorry? I'm, I'm very interested in knowing this divide in between do we treat preprints as a work in progress so that we can take influence from the community or do we treat it as it should be of a standard the same as a journal anywhere, therefore you don't put anything on preprint unless it's already there. See Mark being possible, maybe she has something to say to that. No, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, I think, I think in, at least in all the experience I have, I think everybody is uh, as careful with what they put on the preprint server as anything they send to a journal. But by putting it on the preprint server first, often just the day before, one day after, uh, they, um, in a sense, are, are having a parallel discussion with, with the community. So. I can't tell you the number of times I've written an email to some friend of mine, the title of which is, your preprint on blah, <laughs> because I read it in the morning and I said, oh, you know, they don't realize that 50 years ago there was this paper by X that they should know about, and, and, I, and I tell them that, or, or that there's some other paper out there. And I'm not just saying that they shouldn't cite me, it's could be whatever. Um, and, and, so, and this is always happening, and, and so it is not necessarily the case that an arbitrary referee or three referees at a given journal would pick up everything like that. And so you, you do get that kind of feedback. But I don't think, I, I would never put anything on the archive that was not already publication. But if, uh, and in that sense, I don't know what John, because they have him here as the most experienced with the preprint. People sometimes say, oh, well, in this preprint server, people will put anything. My, my, my impression is that that is not happening because it takes too much work, as you say, to prepare a manuscript to put something out. So, so this, this yeah. Is, no, I, I agree that's entirely our problem as well, for all the reasons that have been stated. Which isn't to say that the process of posting and receiving the feedback from the community that you allude to, that, will, that can improve what is subsequently um, submitted and subsequently published. Uh, so there, are the two, there could be two further steps in the iteration of that particular manuscript. Um, one in response to the community and one in response to the usually um, uh, private uh, peer review process that a journal may impose. I also think in terms of people having responsibility to be aware of the current literature, at least I think it's not only in my head, but I think it's in many people's heads that there, you now have a responsibility <coughs> to be monitoring what's going on in sort of the obvious sections of the archive. And if you're writing a paper on a subject which appears uh, there in some reported paper, you should cite it as archive or whatever, because that's the responsible thing to do. It's out of the public domain. Give credit to the author. Yeah. So do you have a feel for what proportion of authors are actually submitting to final archives before they submit to a journal? I mean, because my impression is it's, it's, it's done concurrently or later. I mean, fairly few people have taken advantage of commenting to try and improve their paper before submitting. Yeah. Um, no, it's, I, I mean, I thought your talk was great and particularly the questions you put up at the end concerning this kind of practice. I, I, all excellent questions, many of which we simply don't have right. answers to at this point. Um, Are you surveying all this? Well, we, now? we haven't yet, but yeah. I think now that we've got a critical mass of manuscripts, then we could start to do some mm -hmm. meaningful work of that. Yeah. I think, as you said, I mean, this is, this is preprints are here to stay. I think the younger, there is a generational change in, in the way things are happening. And therefore, because it's still a small community that is using it, it's a good moment to shape what it's coming. Yeah. If it's possible in this world of multiplicity yeah. and variety yeah. and complexity. But I mean, I, to, to Catherine's point, I, I certainly, you know, <coughs> the, the, um, 
um, anxieties that I referred to that needed to be addressed. I think we've come some way yeah. to dealing with those anxieties, but not the full way. Sure. There is a lot still to go. And we've heard some of that expressed mm -hmm. here. <coughs> and, and there is, but, but I think in that, the funders, the hiring, the people that are hiring are very important. And the Rockefeller University, as you know, just recently has been very explicit yeah. about, about the fact that they admit patients as proof of productivity and approved. If the welcome trust is going to, to do that, those are push. And I think as a community, we have to work as a community to make sure that it doesn't work. The issue, of, just to wrap up this session, the issue of precedent, the issue of, of, of being the first, it's a very interesting one because those of you who are in, in this field that follow the archive and you have your colleagues, I've seen at least three different instances this year of a paper appearing in, in, in one of the so-called high impact factor journals and within a week, a completely similar manuscript from a very big lab being deposited in the archive. I don't think that's coincidence. I think, I think this is, I've seen several, several famous instances of this. And, and I think there is a recognition. I mean, this is, I mean, it's only we, this is my view, we've created this issue that only a journal can give you precedence. When, you know, we were talking about the Royal Society, I don't think Lubin would, seems to be much in the news today, he was very much worried about that. Yeah, that's why they're, they're all making all these big facts. And just to pick up on that, Alfonso, you may be aware of the uh, instance earlier this year when a group uh, in North America published uh, a genome of a species of tardigrade yeah. uh, and, and made various conclusions about lateral DNA transfer. Um, and, and to your point, a week later, uh, an Edinburgh group posted a paper that where they had sequenced the same organism and found very different conclusions. Unfortunately, that seemed to lead to a very collegial uh, outcome, uh, which, in my view, benefits science enormously. So, you know, there's another sort of use case for preprints that um, can be uh, used to correct the scientific record more or less as it evolves and not, you know, a year, two years, three years down the line. I mean, we are talking here about preprints, not about peer review, but peer review, modern peer review has a lot of soul searching to do. So, uh, I think it'd be good to have just a yes. I just want to give one one somewhat funny anecdote, which I think might indicate where things could go. So, those people who whose lives was revolved around high energy physics archives have been known to time their submission to the archive so that in tomorrow's emailing list that goes to everybody, it will appear at the top. <laughs> yeah, because you know, they're going to be fifteen. Uh, papers in, in the daily list, uh, who's going to read all the way through to 14 or 15? So you want to be <laughs> Is that much microengineering? <laughs> so I'd just like to have a little break, 10 minutes. I know that this is a chance that many of you to leave, and I'd like to, to, to get into the discussion with the users. It's going to be good. Please stay with us, but let's take this opportunity to, to just move around a little bit, 10 minutes. And I really want to thank everybody, because I think, I think we're learning a great deal about what we <laughs>
we are in the, in the most important part that, that uh, many people want to hear, which is the users. And I really am I'm very glad that, that I managed to, to draw Steve from Warwick so that we can communicate as human beings rather yes. than on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and I recommend everybody to look at his blog <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing and it's fun. And I don't know where he gets the time to crunch all those numbers <laughs> because he's... he's, he's um, Blog is not just about thoughts, but it's about numbers. As I think you quoted one of his, one of his posts in there. So, Steve. Okay, thank you, Alfonso. Thank you for the uh, introduction, and thanks for inviting me. So I'm, I just thought I'd say a few words about how and why I became a pre-printer. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I'm, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm a user. I've deposited a few pre-prints. I'm going to talk about the ones that I've deposited. Um, uh, although John didn't want to un unmask me, I'm also an affiliate of BioArchive, so I'm one of the people that does the screening. Um, and I just thought I'd um, describe a little bit about myself. So um, I don't think I'm anything uh, extraordinary, uh, as in I don't think I'm a, an, a kind of radical in, in any shape or form. So I'm a cell biologist. My lab works on membrane traffic and mitosis. Uh, I've been a group leader for about 10 years uh, in universities. Um, I, like a lot of other scientists, would like science to be more open. So in cell biology, we don't have a great record of uh, sharing data, code, and these kinds of things, whereas in other areas of biology, I see fields like genomics have got a very open mindset, and I wish that uh, my field was a little bit more like that. Um, I, like every other scientist on the planet, is frustrated by the scientific publication system. It's a long list of, um, of kind of quibbles that I have, and everybody has with this system, but the one that I really wanted to talk about today was about how long it takes to publish a paper and the impact that this has on, on the careers of trainees in my, in my group. Um, so that's going to be what I'm going to talk about. <coughs> um, so the other thing that kind of got, got me into pre-printing, as Alfonso mentioned, I write a blog. Um, it's a kind of data analysis blog. Uh, and what's astonishing to me is that, well, firstly, that anyone reads what, <laughs> what I write, but, but also it's read by thousands of people. So this is far in excess of the number of people who actually read my papers, which is kind of depressing. But, um, uh, but the thing is, I can, I can work on a blog post for a few hours, press publish, and it's online. It can be read by anyone with an internet connection, and I start to get comments and feedback and interaction with everyone you know, around, the, around the planet. 
So feedback is instant, it's from a wide audience. And I really see this as the same as uh, with preprints. So if you compare this with a scientific paper, it takes me weeks, months to write a paper, and then we have to go through this arduous process to publish the thing, um, and, you know, and your soul is dying during this entire process. Um, whereas, you know, preprints bring the joy back. You can just, like, get this thing out there and start getting feedback immediately. And so I don't think... I, I see preprints as being um, an extension of what I was doing before I began preprinting. So I've always encouraged people in my lab to talk about unpublished data at meetings. I, I talk about unpublished data when I give a talk. Um, I you know, was giving my manuscripts to colleagues to read and to give feedback on. But preprints, I, I really see as just a way of, of doing just that, just on a bigger scale, and able to get feedback from a wider audience. OK, so this is from my, uh, uh, some analysis that I did from my blog, uh, which is called Quantized. Uh, the spelling is a little bit peculiar, so that you can Google it easily. Um, so the, this graphic. Um, illustrates how long it takes my lab, or me in particular, to publish papers. So um, there's quite a lot of information in there, and I just wanted to focus on actual research papers, so I'm just going to blow up this top section. And so what you can see here, the time zero is uh, the time when the paper was sent to the journal that it finally appeared in. So the first thing you can see is that the timelines for these papers go back into the minus time. So there's a lot of time shopping papers around in some cases. In some cases, we get lucky, and the first journal we send it to is, uh, wants to publish it, so that's good. There's also some to and fro. So you can see the orange, orange time is when it's with the journal, and the green time is when it's back with us being revised. So we're, we're quite guilty of the publication delay, because we're doing experiments to meet the demands of the reviewers. And then finally, the paper gets accepted, and that's where the purple line starts. That's when they put the uh, paper online, and then the purple line finishes when it's actually finally pre um, published online, um, you know, as the final article. So that gap in between where the orange ends and the purple starts is the time that the journal processes. So the entire thing from submitting to actually appearing as the finished article can take quite a long time. And the reason I was interested in this was I was a bit worried about whether we were taking longer than anyone else or same or less. So to look at this, um, I looked at all data from uh, these are journals in my field or developmental biology field and this is harvested from PubMed so the the data is from the journals themselves so uh, the accuracy of that rests with the journals um, what we're looking at here is a, the lag time from receiving the paper to actually publishing the paper so that's what we call rec to pub and <clears throat> for these journals on the left these are box plots um, sorted by year so uh, at the top is cell, and so the darkest colour is 2014, I think. It goes back 10 years. And you can see there's a kind of trend, which you can see with some journals towards the bottom, that this lag time is getting longer. Um, if we just look at the medium times in days for, for 2013, I've ranked these journals appearing on the left uh, in order of the quickest to the slowest. And so cell, cell, stem cell were the slowest, and their medium time is 284 days. And the thing is, is that actually, if you haven't looked it up, I had to look this up. So ovulation to birth of a human being is 268 days. So actually, uh, you'd be quicker to uh, produce a baby than 50% than of the papers uh, appear in this, uh, this journal. Uh, they, they didn't like me um, putting that online, but anyway. Um, so, I, um, so, uh, so I was worried about the, the impact this has on, on uh, the careers of the people in my group. And so... The other thing I looked at is um, when people join my lab and when they leave and the papers that they publish. And this is a timeline of my lab. So the data's a little bit old, but you can see that the sticks are when people join the lab and, the, and they end when they left. And uh, the symbols indicate their papers. So that's a little bit difficult to kind of understand. But if we just line everybody up so they start at the same time they, and they leave when they leave, you can see there's in a lot of cases people are not publishing their papers until they've, uh, you know, they've left and then the paper comes out later. So this is a problem if you're looking for a job because uh, to get a job you need papers and if you don't have a paper then it's more difficult to get a job. And so if you're, the median time to get a paper out is nine months and you know, it can easily take two or more years to get a paper together and the average person staying in my lab for about three years. So there's a bit of a problem here. And I really see preprints as being the solution to, to this quandary. Um, <clears throat> so 
It means we can get work out sooner, and it means that uh, people have got something to show uh, for the time they've spent in my lab, uh, you know, even if the finished product is, is going to come out in a few months' time. Um, so I would just, I just wanted, this is the last slide, but it's going to take me a while to get through. Uh, these are the preprints that I've done so far. I, I, if I was a bit more, had a bit more entrepreneurial flair, I would have live pre-printed something today. Uh, but I'm just waiting for comments back from one other author, but I'm ready to go with uh, another preprint, which is formatted in tech. Oh, he's gone, but um, anyway. Right, so uh, the first preprint I did uh, was back in 2014, and this is kind of like a bit of a cheating preprint. So the paper had been at eLife for some time and was eventually accepted. And in the acceptance email, it said, why don't you put it on a preprint? Uh, server because at the time eLife didn't have the capacity to put papers immediately online. They, they do that now. But I thought, I knew about BioArchive being launched and I thought, yeah, why not? So that was my first preprint and then it came uh, online at eLife uh, sometime the next month. And I kind of got the taste for it then. So we had some data sitting around which showed that um, a, a paper which was published in Cell on this compound called Pitstop2 um, wasn't quite all it seemed. And so we thought, well, the best way to tell the community about this was just to get a preprint out there and then, uh, you know, send it to a journal. If they're interested, fine. If they're not, fine. We've, at least we've told everybody. And so really that was the second taste of preprinting for me. So um, actually I was interested in Catherine's talk. Um, so I, I'm not sure Bio Biology Open were actually taking preprints at the time. I, um, but anyway, uh, we sent it there and it was published in Biology Open. But... Definitely at this point, I was, I was not a committed preprinter. I was thinking of you know, things where it was of little consequence to me, uh, to the lab, and little danger. So I was really testing the water here. The preprint that really changed my mind was the next one. So this is uh, Christina in my lab, went to a meeting in Germany and discovered to her horror that two other labs were working on exactly the same thing. And she came back to the lab a bit freaked out. So we thought, OK, let's. Uh, preprint this, let's get a DOI, let's get a date stamp and you know, show that we are where we are. And so we did that and we sent it to a journal which reviewed it and then rejected the paper, which was annoying. Um, and we then sent it to Biology Open uh, where it got published. But without that date stamp, we wouldn't have been able to prove that we had submitted this paper when we submitted it. And so you know, this isn't, this isn't the discovery of CRISPR, this isn't a patent war or something. But it was incredibly important to Christina in my lab. And it actually turns out that th there was actually a third lab working on this that published a paper around about the same time. So, um, you know, this really matters for the people in, in, in our groups. And I, I, I think it's important for them to stake the, the priority claim and preprints are essential to doing this. So the next paper um, I didn't preprint. Uh, that also went to eLife and uh, went straight into eLife. And, um, I regret not pre-printing this, but at the time, um, JCS and JCB were still not saying that they would accept preprints, and because they're key journals in my field, I didn't feel that I could um, take the risk. If eLife had rejected this paper, I wasn't quite sure where we would have sent it. So, um, so I didn't pre-print that, and I think things have changed now. Virtually all all journals um, that would be target journals in the cell biology field are preprint friendly, and so I don't really see any reason not to preprint anymore. So this is why I became a preprinter. So the most recent preprint I did was this summer. Um, so Laura from my lab has developed this system for triggering endocytosis on demand. Um, we're really excited about this paper. Um, so we, we preprinted it, and we got uh, quite a lot of feedback on this. Um, uh, and it's currently in revision for eLife, which we're hoping to send back the revised version soon. Um, so just to, just to say about the feedback that we've been getting, so none of, I don't think any of those preprints have got any comments below them on BioArchive, uh, but I had um, emails about all of those papers um, from people who'd read the paper and wanted to comment. Um, uh, the, so the one, uh, the one on pit stop, we, um, we waited for feedback before sending it to, to a, um, the journal. The last one, we've not, we didn't bother, we just did this one-click uh, submission thing, transfer from BioArchive to eLife. It's true that it's one button, but actually eLife came back to us and said, oh no, you need to do something with your files and whatnot. So it's not quite as simple as they say. But, um, um, 
Yeah. But it's a very useful service. Um, but yes, we, we are getting feedback. The other feedback that I've had, which is really interesting, is from uh, journal clubs. So student organized journal clubs in the States um, and in, in the UK, uh, people have written to me saying, yeah, we covered your paper, you're preprinting our journal club, and that's, that's great. I mean, it means that people are out there, they're reading the, the work and, um, and commenting on it. This is, this is all good. So um, I really see this as the, you know, the way that science should be done. And, and I don't think it's that different to the way I was doing science before preprints uh, came along. So that's really what I wanted to say. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Do you need no, just come here because there is a microphone. Do you need any? No, 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 okay. no. You're going free fall. I'm going, to, I'm going to, yes, freestyle. Okay. <laughs> this is Alvin uh, Scully from the Department of Genetics. He didn't have to come from Warwick. Nope. No, from Limerick. From anywhere. No, 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 just down the road. Yeah, so um, I, won't, I will be brief, but I should give you... Just introduce myself a little bit. So my current work is on is in genomics in this field, which, as Steve pointed out, has quite enthusiastically has quite enthusiastically adopted um, um, preprints as a way of communication communicating science. Um, and my own background, which is not unusual in that field, and this is perhaps part of the reason for it, uh, it was in physics. So I found um, some of what Ray was saying quite familiar. In that, when in that field, what we would do, we would read um, the daily list of preprints that were published in that subject, um, and you wouldn't really look at, say, something like journal title pages because that would tend to be preprints that you'd seen six months ago um, and uh, had already therefore read and discussed. Um, so clearly, nevertheless, journal publication um, served a purpose there, and it's worth thinking about what purpose that it, it, it was and is serving. And I also think that we shouldn't, although some of those ideas from that community have kind of inspired um, things in, like bioarchive and our use of preprints, we shouldn't, certainly shouldn't, this is a difficult thing for a physicist to admit, but all is not perfect in the world of physics, and we certainly shouldn't, <laughs> sign of how far I've come, uh, we shouldn't uh, feel that, um, that, you know, by emulating that field that we have therefore achieved what, you know, nirvana for scientific publishing. And I think the opportunity here is for us in biology to do, uh, first of all, to do things differently because it's a different field, it's a lot bigger, the, the challenges are different, and also to do things better. We're starting now with technologies available um, uh, that, you know, you know, to us and that we can see where things are going that maybe people didn't have, uh, certainly when I was in physics. So um, I think that it's a really exciting time um, at the moment, and I think it's a, it's a very positive thing uh, that we have the opportunity to, to really to shape scientific communication um, in a way which really suits the way science and the way that the whole world um, is changing and has developed. And there's big challenges there um, for us in, in, in getting it, in integrating it with, in doing this in a way which doesn't leave people behind or doesn't disrupt too many things um, and gets, in particular, that journals have a, uh, find a way, find a path to, to integrate themselves into that. Um, and to remain relevant and useful. But I really do think that is a challenge for them, uh, and that they must um, uh, 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 acknowledge and adapt, and I think they are. I don't think this is a case of users against journals. Um, they, this, the, the, the challenge is for us all to find ways for these things to be um, of the greatest use to us. Um, so my own personal feeling is that the real crux of this, actually, you know, in some ways, preprints are a no-brainer, uh, from it, there, there are many, many positive things about using them, publishing your work there, um, uh, and, 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 many, and, and I think a lot of the problems are quite minor niggles that we can easily get around. I think the big thing for us to address really is where does peer review stand in all of this, um, and to what extent, what role is peer review playing, and how do we get that, how do we improve that, and how do we incorporate that into whatever vision that we have for, for scientific publish, publishing in the future. Um, at the moment, peer review is something which is fundamental and everybody recognizes this. I mean, in fact, it's a bit like that Churchill's quote about democracy. It's the worst form of um, uh, scientific assessment ever, except for all of the others. Um, so uh, I think we, we do have to have peer review in some shape or form. Um, 
But at the moment, what's happening, what happens is it, it doesn't get captured. It's some of the most valuable form of scientific communication, this you know, deep engagement of um, one person with another person's work, discussing it in depth, and yet mostly none of it, nobody else gets to see it, except in a few enlightened cases. Uh, it, it gets forgotten about. It doesn't get credit, which I think is, undermines it. Um, within the field, for example, you, don't, you can say you peer-reviewed something, but that's about it. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't really get, you know, it, it's seen as a sort of a, an obligation on our behalf, but not really, I think, something that we, regard, we, we reward properly. So I think that is a problem with peer review as it stands. I also think the quality of peer review is, suffers as a result. I think it's quite uneven in quality. I, think, I don't think that's a controversial statement. So my ideal, really, for, for where we would go would be something like one of these overlay journals, um, where if that were the norm for scientific communication. Um, Something where uh, which uh, where the where where the funding that is available for communication um, goes is where there's public money, which essentially is where most of this money is coming from in the first place, where that is channeled more directly into some sort of set of journals like this um, to which we contribute and to which our contributions as peer review, as readers, as commenters, as submitters, is 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 more open and transparent. Um, and therefore enables us all to get credit from that in, in appropriate ways, in ways which help our careers uh, in a timely fashion, rather than simply saying at the end of the year, well, you know, this year I did some peer review for, uh, for such and such a journal uh, for sale or whatever, um, uh, and it goes somewhere in your CV. That's essentially the, 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 the extent of it at the moment. Um, so I, I think that's essentially all I want to say, apart from to emphasize that for me, scientific, and it, we've already had this, brought up before about the Royal Society. You know, scientific communication is not new. Um, and it, it, it predates uh, the system that we currently have. Journals, in many ways, are something which have grown since the early 20th century as a thing, uh, along with scientific career as a, as, as a thing, as a widespread sort of thing that we can all go into and do uh, uh, as a job. Um, and they solve the problems that that the scientific career had at that point, that the scientists had in terms of getting communication around the world rapidly, as it was then. But aspects of that are no longer the best solution for how science works today. And I think that, that scientific communication is what we want to be focusing on, not preserving certain types, of, certain modes of communication, but looking towards something which um, does even more efficiently, an even more efficient way uh, of, of communicating the way that scientists used to by sending manuscripts around, circulating themselves. And they were the original preprints. In some ways, they predate journals, and I think they will actually outlive them as well, perhaps, in the form that we currently understand it. So that's, I think, my thoughts, in a way, rambling thoughts. <laughs> well, Sudakaran is the, the last speaker. What, what, um, all we were saying reminds me, some of you know that I like football. I built the great game champion. He said, football is a very simple game, more complicated by idiots. <laughs> and you should say scientific communication is a very simple thing, made complicated by call whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, so Thank you, Alphonse, for uh, inviting me here um, to talk about what I think about preference. So um, before I just launch into what I really think about uh, the whole process, I just want to give a brief, brief background of uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I did my postdoc in Harvard Medical School. Um, before I started my own uh, group just a couple of months back, uh, I spent a year uh, as an editor in science signaling. Um, that is, I worked with in AAAS um, in Washington, D.C. as a, a their professional editor. So part of my job was to um, go around the world and talk about uh, demystifying um, publication process, writing cover letters, um, writing good abstracts, and how to publish in science and science familiar journals. That's what I was doing for one year. And besides that, I was um, uh, reviewing 25 active manuscripts a week, um, uh, following 20 journals, um, and doing analytics for uh, science signaling and um, a sister journal of science, a little bit of uh, uh, analytics for science translation medicine. So pretty much the kind of data that you were looking at. Um, I'm not sure why it's not displaying. Um, so, okay, uh, it's not displaying, but you know, just tell what what is what is it about? Uh, 
that's fine. Okay. So, so, so basically, um, I can tell you a little bit about what um, we were doing, uh, or I was doing in my previous job. Uh, I can tell you that the journals are also more interested in how their papers are perceived and how they are, um, um, you know, what, what's the impact of the papers that they are publishing. How many times it's been blogged, who is um, um, uh, talking about that in the Twitter, and uh, those kind of metrics. That, that's what um, John, I think, mentioned, the alt metrics. And that is what uh, is becoming uh, the most important thing, the alt metrics. It's not just citations, because I've done extensive analysis on um, science signaling papers. Uh, I know that really um, big papers have been just cited just once. Uh, from big labs, and then there are these other papers that have been cited many times. So it's there isn't correlate. Uh, it's hard to find any uh, correlation between um, you know where it's coming from and how many times it gets cited and uh, what's its impact. So I think fundamentally, what we're talking about here is in, in this preprint process, two things. One is um, peer review, and the other one is uh, impact of your work. So so that's what I think is is happening uh, in, in this peer review process. The reason uh, why I quote peer review is, is, is uh, the most important thing is because of my own frustration as, a, as an editor in my previous life. Um, as an editor, as I told you, we are all inundated with information. We are just drowning with lots of uh, work. Uh, I have to give credit to my colleagues, and they're just good scientists as well, critical scientists. They're, they're, they're doing their job extremely well. But then um, we are given only two weeks' time um, to make a decision about a paper and then we send it out to review. The problem is with, with the anonymous reviewers, and I can quote this in, uh, uh, live as well, because they are given two weeks time to come back with comments, and usually it takes two months. That has been the major problem, and it's not the problem of the journal, it's not the problem of the handling editor, it's not the problem of the science, it's the time factor that, uh, that uh, you mentioned uh, is, is largely because uh, the, s the reviewers who have accepted, or sometimes, uh, I, I find it, uh, I, I struggle to even get reviewers. I, I, I have to look for 15 people to, uh, and ask 15 people to sign up. So that is where, as scientists, like, you know, whether, whether it's um, uh, a, sub, a submission in bioarchives or a submission in journals, uh, you know, we can expedite that process. And, and, and lower the frustration is, is by turning in our reviews um, quickly. I think that's something that you might agree. <laughs> <laughs> that has been the major bottleneck, and I think uh, that should be emphasized. It's not the channels or the editors, right? Uh, and that's what bioarchives uh, submissions uh, is, is uh, all about, because you get instantaneous comments, instantaneous reviews, and that uh, is uh, also um, rewarding for authors. Um, so that's I think that's the model that uh, they are working on, and that's uh, great. The second thing is. How do you evaluate uh, the impact of your work, right? What is the metrics? What, what are the, you know, it, because it's important. Um, I see, I noticed that Wellcome Trust um, and, and other funding agencies are here. But um, when it comes, to, you know, they're happy with, you know, uh, the scientists putting their work in, in, in bioarchive. But when it comes to uh, funding, do they really accept open access submissions? It's something which I wanted to ask. Um, not only well contrast, but just about any funding organizations. Because uh, it's not only funding organizations, it's also uh, promotion committees, um, uh, you know, faculty promotion committees, or postdoc promotion committees, or, or, or thesis committees. Uh, because I know um, for a fact, a uh, couple of people in, in California, and these scientists um, really believed in open access publication, and, and, and in, uh, they, 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 they published five of their papers in PLOS One. They didn't get tenure. I know they're good scientists. They could have gotten into, you know, they could have gotten their manuscript into one of the big journals and got tenure. So they took that decision and they had to pay for it. Um, recently, a colleague of mine was telling me that um, he sent one paper to a big methods journal, um, and the editor kind of uh, rejected, uh, saying that this is not of the general scope. Um, and then he submitted it into bioarchives, and in, in a couple of days, he got 50 people liking it and commenting on it. And he sent that, those comments to the, uh, so the, the, the methods editor journal, and then that person saw those comments and took the, took the paper um, in for peer review. So that's one kind of what's happening. We are also changing uh, um, the perception, or we are 
I, I wouldn't say that. Um, some people call it educating the editors, but uh, that's the wrong thing to say. Um, so fundamentally, I think I think it boils down to two things, right? Um, how uh, how we are going to change the peer review system, as Alvin pointed out, and that is what is what what we should be addressing, because it's flawed. Uh, flawed in the sense. Uh, three anonymous people get to see it, and uh, three people don't agree. It's a gray area, um, and at well, some point, the editor has to take a call, and the editor actually, when he takes a call, or she, he or she takes a call, it, it's a thankless uh, job, because somebody's going to be frustrated. And I've had um, comments from um, reviewers who are not happy with the decision uh, that I ended up you know, passing that manuscript. So, um, so you have to think seriously about peer review, and that's important. And 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 uh, bodies that are evaluating um, uh, the impact of the work have to consider what <coughs> metrics they're going to choose. The health metrics, how many times uh, that work has been blocked, is that uh, something that, that that you would consider or, or not? So that's the kind of question that I want to ask. So I'm not here to. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm here to advocate for or buy our cards, but I'm going to leave you with these questions. Like, we have lots of work to do. Um, and then we'll definitely see a transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody, would you like to say something again? Brian was a bit shy, but I think I'm glad that he is the last speaker. Well, I'll just ask you, please. That's very quick. I was, I was, Brian and Rick. I was on the list, and uh, I thought, what am I going to say? Actually, I have nothing to say. So, um, but then one thing you said, I thought, right. I, I was. My, my only submission to BioArchive so far has been um, a paper which is contradicting something that's, that's been out there. There are very few of those. So, um, and we also decided we had no need to publish it at all. We just wanted people to know. So I'll just give you a bit of a case report, although Steve had the same, same effect. So when I was a postdoc, um, I, was, I discovered this group of proteins, and somebody published a paper in a very high-profile journal um, saying it had this spectacular activity, which I... I'd actually reviewed the paper for another journal and, and thought it was terrible, and said, "Well, I eventually said I'm not going to review this anymore because I'm working on a protein," and I thought it was just nonsense. <clears throat> and so this got published in a very high impact journal, and so I spent a year of my postdoc demonstrating we couldn't reproduce it. Of course, you can never prove something doesn't do a protein doesn't do an activity. You can only say we can't get it to do it. So I spent a year doing that, which was a total waste of time and money. But in the, the whole time, I was getting requests from all over the world for this for CDNA back in the day when you had to get requests. People had, I had to send the CDNA out to people. Nobel laureate from New York, from the States, and all over the world, people were asking for this. And I would say, here it is. But just so you know, I can't reproduce any of this. Okay? But who knows how many people spent their grant money working on this thing, which is nonsense. It's never been retracted. It's paper. So, so as a junior group, as a group leader. Again, another protein I was working on, there was a spectacular claim in a very high-profile journal, which I thought, okay, that's interesting, you know, it seems a bit overblown, but whatever. And then, and then I was digging through the ChIP-seq data, which I tend to do, and discovered an anomaly. And I thought, this is quite bad. And a colleague <coughs> looked a bit deeper and found quite a serious anomaly. We felt quite a serious anomaly, which um, made the whole thing the whole paper not viable. We thought this was a serious issue, and it was such a high-profile thing that we felt that the community needed to know. Because we felt, first of all, this was simply not true, and I don't want people spending their money on this. So we got in touch with the editors of the journal, um, and they did send our comment out to the, to the other author, and they sent it for peer review, and the other author basically said, yes, what you've discovered is true, but that doesn't compromise the rest of the study. Because everything, because because the bit you can test, yes, is faulty. The bit you can't test, that's all fine. <laughs> and the reviewers and the editors they took this person's word for it, um, and so they rejected our our thing, and so it wasn't published. So we t discussed with a few of the journals about trying to publish it, but there was no there was no primary new data in this, and so we felt it was important that the community be aware of this. What we felt was a serious issue. And they could make up their own minds. So we put in a bio archive, and um, again, the only comments underneath it are from the author of the other paper. But the other, the author of the other study was able to post his own thing on bio archive, so he could put his story. So there's our our opinion, and there's his, which has got to be fair. And and you know everybody else can read both and decide what you want. But we got so many emails from colleagues saying, "Oh, thank you. <laughs> now I get it." 
I, I always had a problem with that paper, and now I see why it doesn't work. So this is just another issue where we didn't feel like we needed to take it any further. We don't need this to get published in the journal because it's there. The, the, the service was, we have serious concerns, and we want you to know about it before you spend your money. And you can read the other person's rebuttal of our con concerns, and if you're satisfied, then, you know, then that's great too. So just another example of how far our category is definitely. Twenty minutes, just wrapping up with, with some small discussion. So I think I think what Brian has, has referred goes back to what this article from from Tony and about about the issue of validation by journals. Any of you journals don't want to know when a paper that they have published turns out not to be reproducible. They don't want to know. The higher the journal, the less they want to know. And this is a this is a problem. But I already have evolved into something quite strange, which I'm not sure Chris is put. Uh, so I think there were a couple of issues. Yes, Hannah. Can I go back to the yes, point please. about the open access and whether we um, Sudakra, Yes, to Sudakra. Whether, whether the Welcome and our panels do look at open access publications equally. The Welcome for a long time has stated that the venue of publication isn't important to us. It's the quality of science. So yes, we do, we do agree but, that but we do. In that case, right? <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's your reviewers and it's your panel. Yes, yeah. and the panel are instructed as part of their induction process that you have to go deeper than your than the title, the, the venue of publication. It's about what's about the three days of reading for a red stack of papers. Yes, there is that issue, and you know we accept that it's a very nice proxy that people like to use, but we don't think it's a valid. Rachel, do you want to say something? Thank you, yes, um, I'm Rachel, I'm from Cross. Um, I have a question for John, I think, um, about a related issue, which is the metrics. What's going to be the strategy, I, I expect at the moment, for article level metrics, they operate on the published version. Is there, going, is there any sort of flip-flop version of metrics being considered where you roll the preprint metrics into the published version of metrics? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question, and that I think I even alluded to that in my final slide, that, that um, metric summary is something we are very interested in. There is not a methodology for that yet, but um, I think it's certainly something we would like to work with journals on doing, and, uh, and I think it's certainly something that authors will, will want. Um, the, the, and, and there's also the issue of, you know, which version of the manuscript gets more yeah. usage. It's an interesting and, question. And mm -hmm. as far as we're concerned, you know, we think that the final certified version of the, the published version of the manuscript should is the one that should be most prominent and should be pointed to most often. Uh, but uh, we haven't dropped there yet. And that's something we'd really like to work with some publishers on, on developing that kind of technology. At the moment, we're working you know, we're, we're all kind of using Altmetric as the uh, source of these of these data, and I, I'm sure we could all sort of talk to um, the, the Altmetric company and figure out how to, how to do this. Um, we go in the analysis on citations of preprints versus citations in the final paper, and you got anything interesting? Yeah, you know, that's exactly my, uh, the library at Cold Spring Harbor is very interested in doing this with and for us, and, uh, we just haven't quite got around to starting it yet. I am also not totally sure what volume of, yeah. um, of citations to preprints there are to actually work with and whether we get any kind of meaningful data yeah. set out of it. But it's certainly something we're interested in. I would love to be able to track the citation pattern from preprint to published version. Because again, we think that and what should linger that. in the scientific yeah. record is the citation to the published version. So something very important in the last 10, 15 minutes, because we are hearing all, all these people that have, so no, I think it's very good. 
but that I, I would like to hear from, from the users, from the people, from the students, postdocs, young PIs, what, what is, and, and, I, and I know because some of you have contacted me before the event with some trepidations that you've been misadvised, I would say, to be careful with preprints. What would convince you? What would you like uh, people to, what would you like preprints to be? so that you would embrace them and you would recommend them to people. What, what are your worries? What, what is that you would like the funders, the journals, your peers? I would, would like to hear from you. And this is a small enough volume that you should be able to talk. Peter. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just to um, from a student's perspective, I, in publishing either a paper or a preprint, I'm very unlikely to see any of this mostly private email correspondence about what's going on. Um, in response to a paper. So I think what I'd like to see and what I'd be interested to know your opinions about is how much should this process of post preprint peer review be formalized? Should we have a, a platform by which we can all review the latest preprinted papers? Or should it be something that happens on the bioarchive comments section, which is currently quite underused? Um, like how, how much do you think that ought to be formalized? Because I think from a student's perspective, I'd be very interested in in hearing the discussion about mm -hmm. my work or in contributing my opinion to someone else's work where I normally wouldn't be able to take part in the peer review process. Yeah. I think a fair amount of it happens on Twitter actually. This isn't it, which is not the ideal platform for it, but it, it has some features which are good for it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so and also, I don't know if it's possible to constrain these things uh, to, to, to certain platforms. I don't. You know, but at least if things are, if at least if things are um, tweetable and then people can write blog posts, that's the sort of model that people had in mind, and, it, and I think that's already a million miles better than um, than just being private emails or, or not happening at all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's a lot of discussion is actually there. It's just it's scattered around the place. Do, do people do people feel that the departments, the funding bodies? that they, they do value preprints? Do people feel that, or they don't know, or they haven't thought? I'm, I'm curious about this. What is the general opinion, the general feeling? <coughs> ben. So I mean, I think I have kind of a politics story about that in the sense that I felt, so I had a paper that was in consideration by a journal as I was applying for my fellowship to the Wellcome Trust, and I put that paper before the name of the journal on the bioarchive. Um, so I don't know whether that was considered by the funders and, and helped me in my application, but I did feel it was there. So that the reviewers of the fellowship could see the preliminary data that was in the paper that was a part of, that helped me, I think, in, in, in the application because it showed that I could do the work and it showed that I could work in the organism that I just moved into. And, and all that data is there that the reviewers could read. I don't know whether they did. I don't know whether they took that into account, but it was there. And, and I think it, they probably did. Because they're close enough to my field, they're the reviewers of my grant application. And so it's likely that they are aware of the open bio archive and have read it and have seen the different real data. So I think that um, it's, it's, it's impossible to know for sure whether these things help, but why not put them there? Because this is such a new thing. I mean, the policy that I advise to people is what is not forbidden, it's allowed. And I think many people, I mean, th this is an issue with this that posting preprints is not an issue until you raise it. With, with whether it is funding bodies or, or other journals, it's like quoting uh, preprints. I mean, again, you can do that, and, and many of us have done it, but it's interesting that then you hear from the journal where you've just done that, oh, we don't allow quoting, but they've missed the point. So this, this, what that means is that this is becoming something that is important and widespread. Yeah. I'll just and say in that sense. Yeah, just to add on, on that point, I think um, you know, for anyone that's out there writing their CV, doing applications, you know, if you find yourself writing submitted to nature or you know, uh, <laughs> you know in preparation for nature, forget it. You know, this just gets passed out. Whereas if you have a preprint, when the person who's looking at your CV can go and download the paper and, and check it out. I had that recently with a postdoc applicant to my lab. His paper was stalled in peer review for over a year, but he had a preprint and I could look at it and check it out. So, um, yeah, so just to back up the assessment. Remember, the worst thing can happen is that the committee ignores that. Yeah. But on the other hand, <laughs> they might notice it, or 50 notice it, but ignore it. Yeah. You want no, to I mean, the, phrase, the phrase that we use is evidence of productivity. 
And, and I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the whole, you know, exactly what you two just said. Can I just go back to your interesting point about the commenting? I mean, I totally agree that, that we would love to see some of that private communication move more into the public sphere. I think there, is, there are two issues to that. One is cultural and one is technological. And I don't think we have good enough technology for this kind of free form conversation to take place around preprints. We use a, mod, uh, a software called Discuss, which is very familiar to lots of people in the sort of trade pub, you know, magazine publishing world. It's very clunky. Um, it's not very intuitive to use. And it also, um, you can register in Discuss with uh, a made up name, essentially. So what we would like to find, and in, in concert with you know, journals and others, is a commenting platform that is probably driven by ORCID, um, where you have to have an ORCID to, to participate so you're identifiable, and something that just works in a much more facilitated kind of way, and would not necessarily be confined just to prepaid servers, but to journals and anything else. That might speak to the technology thing. You've still got the cultural <coughs> question of whether people will really put their head above the parapet and weigh in to criticize someone who they may be worried about will have some sway over their future career in some fashion. And I think that's a that's a, an issue that a preprint service can't solve. I'd like, like to say something about that, but should I kind of want to say something? Sorry, uh, in response to that, uh, uh, why don't we instantly, why don't you instantly twice that process. So let's say somebody's actively engaged or a scientist is actively engaged in critically evaluating a manuscript or, or a submitted paper in archives, there's some kind of scores that's attributed to him. Uh, I know that there are lots of um, reviewer-based uh, scores that are coming up. So people can say, I reviewed for so many papers and we get a score. And you can actually put that in your CV, uh, what that score is. Likewise, in bioarchives, you can actually uh, incentivize the process of commenting, you know, not like random comments, but the critical evaluation of what is out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I think that's that's a very worthwhile point. Um, I actually had a conversation recently with the founder of Publons. Yeah. Uh, and they are very concerned about um, moving peer reviewing into more of the limelight of academic work than it is now. And uh, so who knows where that conversation will go. I mean, it, it, um, it's certainly a worthy aim. I think it's not something, again, that I believe BioArchive could do by itself, but, but uh, I think the process of giving that kind of uh, recognition and credit to peer reviewers is a, a very worthwhile goal. I think, um, I understand the point you're making, but I don't think it actually reflects what life in science is really like. And, you know, I refer to all these thousands of scientists who come to meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, and we sit in the auditorium and hear great and unpublished work. So there is, I think, in science a long history of sharing, um, in controlled conditions, um, the work that you are doing. And we all know that there is competition, there are things that you might want to talk about but not want to talk about. But I think it's part of the training of a scientist to know how to how to share, how to interact, how to communicate, get the benefit of that community effort while 
um, you know, retaining your independence as, a, as an investigator. And I think preprints fall into exactly that same kind of category, as we heard from Ray. Maybe not for every paper, every observation, and so on. Yeah, and uh, so I think one of the, I mean, I said when we were talking about preprints and the, the underlying data behind it, you know, data sharing is an interesting area, shall we say. People have very different views on it. Some people believe are very open and they are very happy to share everything, and they think that you know, actually, the production of the development, the, the data is the thing that. Recognition for you can add citations to data and you can track data reuse. However, you can't control the reuse of data. So perhaps it, it's coming back to that idea of that controlled environment and, and you know, science is happy to share in a controlled environment, but how do you work in a more open environment? So I would say we know as a funder that we are not there at the point of knowing what, what we should recommend should support it. Um, and so we're going to, it's an area that we're, we're looking into. We don't think that a blanket policy like we've got with our open access communication one is, is the right approach to data. But we would like to perhaps be a sort of just like shifting from closed to standard to something more open and standard um, in a long term. But we appreciate that that's not going to happen overnight and we don't want to. Somebody somewhere paid for this research, and it wasn't me. I didn't pay for it. So I have a debt to clear. Now this, at a very minimum, represents a mechanism for doing that. Typically at any time I'll have three, maybe four papers under review. That's fine, you're a big push getting manuscripts out. There's that period of grace when you're thinking, great, now I'll get on with something else. And then the reviews come back. You do the so-called reviewer experiments with the topic of a some years ago. The crap that some reviewer thinks would be a consequence of your work, it's not essential to your hypothesis, but they would like to see you do because it's actually the sort of thing that they would have done if they were designed the experiments rather than you. <laughs> so the paper doesn't advance by incorporating that experiment, but it's delayed. In some cases, in one case with us, with a nature submission which never made it by two years, for goodness sake. But we tried to do the the knockouts work that, that, that the reviewers demanded <coughs> of us and then rejected once we resubmitted it. So this represents a great mechanism. Who knows, some of these bioarchal papers might well make it into regular publication in due course, but as a minimum, we've satisfied the, 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 the funders' requirements, <coughs> pay your debt, you can retire with a clear conscience. <laughs> Oh, well, I just wanted to support what you said, actually. I mean, I think um, uh, there is a huge amount that needs to be done in the context of the incentive system of science. And, uh, and actually, journals are not helping. And, and we've heard in some ways, right? In some, in, in, some case, in some ways they are, and in some ways they are not. We've heard examples where journals have, and, 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 and this is, you're right, you know, journals are reluctant to publish work that challenges uh, work that has been published in that journal. Um, you know, um, so that is a problem. And so, although there is a mechanism now to share a very rigorous piece of work which does challenge 
um, um, very effectively a piece of published work, and a lot of people are you know, happy about that. The new people coming to that existing article, well, they they're not because they don't they have they can't make the connection because they can't see the link to this new thing that's over in, in some preprint archive somewhere. So, uh, but and that's just one example, and 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 so. I don't know, I just feel like there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done to improve the way scientists are evaluated and the fact that there's this very unidimensional approach which is all about um, the papers you've published in the journals that you've published them in. Just the fact that it's all based on papers, why is it even just based on papers? Why isn't it? You know, why doesn't it take account of the other resources beyond just data that you've made available that other people have then used to do interesting work with, that you have gone to the trouble of making available, you know, properly documented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I just think that, 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 that there is a, a really a, a, a strong need to, to completely reform the way um, the way this process works, the way scientists. Well, Mark, I think it's so important. Those of us who, like him, look at our careers with more hindsight than foresight, yeah. and, and that appears publishers that there is no things are changing all the time. Things have changed over the last 30 years, both in the publishing world and in the way. And this is the important thing, that we are now in a transition phase. It's a very, very important transition phase because the internet, communication, social media is changing that. But this reflects the uncertainty that we have. Right. I mean, one of, of my fears you know, is, is that this breaks into two. As, as you all know, self press has a very different attitude towards all this than, than the rest of the community. And, and there is there is a fear that, that maybe like in society it breaks into two, some that are going one way and some are that would be unfortunate because as you've said, there is a public debt that, that we have to pay with this. And I really like very much the comment that you've made about, about that that's a value that many of us maybe perhaps have not seen. But I think you brought it into the question. But it's important that we're moving. That this is moving and that we have a chance to shape the things. Particularly you. I mean the, the younger people are the ones that, that can influence and, and there are some fantastic examples as well of, of, of early career scientists who are doing just that, you know, that are taking a much more open approach yeah. um, and, and are succeeding. Yeah. So, uh, so, 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 I was kind of interested in the, the incentivization thing, and I think, you know, like John mentioned Poblons, which is, you know, I don't know how many. Most of us don't know. Yeah, so has anybody heard of Poblons? Relatively few people. This is, so Poblons is a a website organization that is trying to give people credit for doing peer review um, in the way that when you've reviewed from a journal, if you're registered with Poblons, you can then log it as being, I've reviewed for this for this journal. Now, there's lots of problems with Poblons at the moment, which is that as a journal, I've got, a, you know, we're development within Poblons, and there are several people listed as editors for development who have nothing to do with the journal, and I can't change that unless we change the pay of money to Poblons. So it's got some issues, but I do think it's an interesting way of of incentivizing people to do peer review. And I think one of the other sort of challenges with preprint in a way is that if you look at the surveys of why do people peer review, why do reviewers spend hopefully a considerable amount of time reviewing the paper, their primary reason is because it's a community service and they think it's a good thing to do. But their second reason is that I get to see the data earlier than everybody else. And with preprints, that no longer applies. And so I do wonder whether what what the balance comes as preprints become more and more prominent, does it become harder and harder to do yeah, are, more peer review? We are coming to the end, but the graph that we showed, which I've seen sometimes from the archive, tells you a story. Because it's the fields that are more prone to yes. deliver and yeah. the fields that are more uh, more reluctant. And, and yeah. There is a story there. It's yes. a I cultural and interesting story. I mean, just to respond just to that last point, that's right, is that um, this, you know, I think what preprints do separate the dissemination from the registration. Yeah. So. In some ways, you could you could say, well, uh, journals have the opportunity now to show what they really can do, yep. which includes a really detailed uh, form of peer review that a very thoughtful kind of peer review that may take longer uh, and gets us away from this uh, yep. what you said about the speed which everybody is so lined up with. But if dissemination of work takes place, then uh, journals have the opportunity to create a much more thoughtful and and, and deep process of, of uh, response to uh, to work, so that the, then the journals that really do that well will rise to yeah. rise to the top. I think so. You, to get better peer review, <coughs> not necessarily. What you're saying is that in one of these feedbacks that often happens, hopefully, deeply, 
will, will start putting some sense into a process that for many of us have, have gone out of time. We said we were going to be here until 5. It is 5 o'clock. I'm really grateful to everybody that has contributed. I hope that uh, many of the questions that you had and maybe have been shy uh, to ask have been answered. And all I can tell you is just spread the word. We make sure that, that we discuss, we keep the conversation going, but we use Twitter. Because I think in the week of open access, and I was very afraid of calling this event the ultimate open access to that for Twitter. So thank you very much.